course, better. Thank you. Um, we want to get started now, so I'm calling the meeting to order. Thursday, January 26, 2017, a regular board meeting of the uh, Santa Barbara City College. Welcome. We have a robust attendance today, and that's always a good thing. We're happy to see people come, uh, and we have quite a number of speakers as well, and that is good. Um, we have some items to be taken out of order first, and the first item is recognitions. So we will start with that. So um, I'm so proud. So proud of the fact that Santa Barbara City College has had a long tradition of recognizing the longevity of its employees. And uh, so at each of our board meetings, I guess it's every other board meeting, we have a time where we recognize uh, individuals that have been with us for a while. And we have two of those today. Uh, the first person is Virginia Estrella, and she's the coordinator for the, the MESA program. And we have Marilyn Spaventa here to, to recognize her. So if you'd come down. Good evening, President and members of the board. It is my great pleasure to honor Virginia Estrella for 10 years of service at Santa Barbara City College, but I can't talk about Virginia without talking about the MESA program because she is the heart and soul. 10 years ago, we hired Virginia away from Ventura Community College where she was already director of a successful MESA program, and <clears throat> we wanted to start one here. That's how it began. <coughs> For anyone who doesn't know, uh, MESA is a state-funded program, math, engineering, science, achievement program. As coordinator, <coughs> excuse me, Virginia manages the program for about 100 students, provides a center, tutors, counselors, clubs, particularly SHIP, the Society for Hispanic Professional Engineers, and SACNAS, the Society for Advancing Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. Virginia is the mentor, the mother figure. She goes to conferences with students across the state and the country. <clears throat> A few comments from Maria Morales, the counselor. Mesa <clears throat> is a source of inspiration and motivation for many underrepresented students. It establishes a sense of community and serves as an extended family. This success can be attributed to Virginia, her extensive experience, and her relentless commitment to student success. <clears throat> From Nick Arnold, professor of engineering, since Virginia has been at SPCC, she has taken SPCC MESA program from the beginning with just a handful of students to a major state program. She has an amazing work ethic. She cares first and foremost about the students and is professional in all she does. She really knows her stuff. <laughs> from a former student, Diana Soto, I gave SBCC my all, and I'm still very proud of everything I did. Why? Because who in the world knew I had it in me? That's what MESA brings out in students. I, it's that I can't believe I have it in me feeling. That's what Virginia helps students find. And finally, from one of our former students, Juan Cepeda, he's now an engineer at Raytheon and has started an organization, the Four Ingenieros. <clears throat> Virginia is the reason for a lot of our successes, and especially mine. She's like a mom to me. Oh my God. Aww. I thought the 
this is going to be a very small recognition. And I'm just so impressed with the words of my students, my, what my dean just shared. I love this program. I love this campus. So I feel fortunate to be here. So I'm just a little bit taken back. You know, I thought it was going to be a very small little c ceremony. So thank you. It is. <laughs> So the second person we have is Shelby Arthur, and we have Carola Smith here to present her uh, certificate and give some words of advice. Good afternoon, President Beebe and members of the board. It's my pleasure to be here and to speak on behalf of Shelby and to recognize her for her 10 years of service. Um, when I first met Shelby 10 years ago, I was really impressed by her um, love for learning, her passion for international education, and also by her very um, disarming and infectious smile that you will see today. <laughs> when she, uh, Shelby first started at the college, she was barely older than most of her students, which made for some uh, interesting advising sessions at first. <laughs> and I particularly recall one morning when Shelby arrived bright and early, dressed up in her rainbow bright Halloween outfit, ready to partake in her first SPCC um, Halloween potluck, only to find out that she had to meet with the student whose visa had been revoked because of her failure to attend classes. So needless to say, Shelby stepped up to the challenge with her usual resolve and determination and diplomacy, and she has since uh, grown to be a competent, compassionate, and caring advisor and mentor to her students. Shelby is always looking for ways to improve how we serve our students. And one of her biggest accomplishments, I would say, was that she single-handedly developed our SBCC ambassador program, which has become a model for student mentorship programs in the state, and uh, which has grown to be one of the largest student organizations on campus. Um, while uh, working throughout the uh, past 10 years full-time and establishing her family, Shelby obtained uh, a master's degree in intercultural relations, a certificate in women and leadership. She completed a one-year intensive um, learning program for professionals in the field of international education and became a certified diversity trainer. So this uh, continued engagement in professional development has really benefited our program as well as the college at large. Uh, in 2014, Shelby was, uh, received honorable mention as the Outstanding Classified Employee of the Year, and I think that that recognition was a true reflection of Shelby's professionalism, her passion for her work, and uh, her contributions to the college. So Shelby, I can speak on behalf of our entire team, they're all there for you, that you have been an amazing colleague and friend and you are a wonderful role model to your students. So. <laughs> Um, I thank you very much, Carola, for those kind words and for sharing my uh, maybe uh, highest achievements and maybe not so high moments in my Rainbow <laughs> Bright costume, <laughs> which I still have, by the way. Um, I uh, love working in the field of international education, and I am very proud to be part of the team that brings global diversity to our community college here in Santa Barbara. So thank you. Good, I get my exercise doing this. Yeah. And that concludes our longevity awards.
Okay. Um, we now have a second item as the report of sabbatical outcomes. Um, and Michael uh, Stinson, professor of film and media studies, uh, is going to present us with an overview of his sabbatical. President Beebe, members of the board. My name is Michael Stinson, and for the last 16 years, I've been a full-time professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies at Santa Barbara City College. I appreciate you taking the time from your demanding schedule to hear about my sabbatical work during the fall semester of 2015. Let me start by saying that my tenure at SBCC has been the greatest pleasure and honor of my professional life. I'm deeply grateful to the college and to you, the Board of Trustees, for giving me the opportunity to take a semester away from the classroom and the demands it entails in order to complete this project. I'm keenly aware of the constraints of time today, so I'll keep my remarks brief. I will take a couple minutes to put my sabbatical project in context and then show you the results in action. And finally, take any questions you may have regarding the project. Film studies began as a single course in 1991 at Santa Barbara City College. And today it has grown to 30 courses, a full department, and over 2,500 enrolled students each year. Contrary to broader patterns across campus, our numbers continue to grow. I routinely teach multiple sections of 140 students or more. As you know, classroom space is highly impacted. And as a department, we're committed to accommodating every student who seeks to enroll in one of our courses. To use our classroom allocation to maximum efficiency, we created a hybrid version of our most popular course, Film Studies 101, Intro to Film. My one, sabbatical, one semester sabbatical was dedicated to creating a fully operational online environment in which to conduct this hybrid course. I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to this environment from the student's perspective. So what you see on the screen is what a student sees when they uh, log on to the course. Um, this will appear in their pipeline account. They click on the course and all of the materials for the course are included here. It's equally, uh, useful for a face-to-face -face course, a hybrid course, or a fully online course. What you're looking at now is a fully online version of the course. Uh, parenthetically, we have an entire degree program that can be done entirely online. Every course required for an AA degree at the college can be taken by a student without ever setting foot on campus. Um, the opening section is a forum, it's a community. Uh, the students uh, communicate with the instructor and with each other. Um, the next section contains the syllabus and the schedule uh, for the semester, week by week. All the assignments, uh, exams, uh, activities are included on that schedule. And then each chapter of the textbook has a dedicated module. And within each module, uh, the students are given an overview of the work that they're going to be doing for that week. Uh, learning objectives, each one of these links out to a page, uh, and the learning objectives are a prelude to the reading and the lecture, uh, flashcards for vocabulary, a screening checklist that the students look at prior to the film that they're screening for that week. Uh, in the case of an online class, the students choose a film from a list and then view that film on their own uh, go through the screening checklist and apply those criteria to whatever film they're viewing and then uh, post a report in the forum section. Um, this is a list of all the films described or illustrated in the text or in the lecture. Uh, and then uh, for each chapter of the book, there's a lecture pre presentation. Uh, for students in the fully online section, this is the lecture. Uh, for students in the hybrid section, uh, they use this as a reference, but come to class once a week and attend a face-to-face -face lecture with the instructor. 
Um, review questions come after uh, the lecture and the reading, and finally a practice quiz so the students can test uh, their knowledge of the material. Um, each chapter in the class text has all of these elements, and they're all posted at the very beginning of the semester. If a student wants to work ahead, they're given all the materials that uh, are available to work ahead. Uh, if a student needs to go back and review, they can do the same. In the middle of the semester, uh, for the fully online course, the midterm is presented uh, online. Uh, it's a multiple choice midterm. And for the students in the hybrid course, the exams are taken in the classroom. Each one of these uh, modules covers an aspect of filmmaking, from uh, screenwriting to cinematography, mise-en-scene, uh, editing, sound, so that by the end of the course, the student has covered every aspect of the filmmaking enterprise. And the final exam, once again, is online for students that are taking the online version of the course, and it's given in the classroom for students in the hybrid or in the fully face-to-face -face sections. And then finally, at the end, uh, are a series of quizzes that the students can take to check their knowledge at the end of the term. And then finally, uh, it links out to the Film Studies website. This is the website that we maintain, um, and it includes a blog which has 3,000 film reviews, all written by students in our classes, many of whom are now uh, fully accredited as journalists to attend film festivals. And I can take any questions if you have questions about any of this or about the film studies department. Yeah. Jonathan? Just one comment. I actually was hanging out with a friend on Wednesday night, and they said they were in this class, and they loved it. So I'm they said so it worked really well online and everything. So I'm so happy Thank to you. hear that. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Mar I, Marty? This seems to be the ideal um, course that would be useful online, I mean, when you think about it. Um, and I, I don't know if you have other professors who might be talking to you about this now that you've done this. I mean, it's really wonderful. Um, I'm open to talk to anyone about it. I, I think that we are one of the pioneers on campus for this type of instruction, the hybrid instruction. And it's, so far it's working very well. We've been doing it for three semesters now. And uh, our numbers are continually going up. Yeah, and, and you know, from my point of view, the old math teacher, and I'm thinking, what could you put on that everybody would click onto and want to see, you know, late at night? Nobody, you know, it's just not there. But, but there must be a way to do that. But I think this is just really wonderful. One footnote is uh, Santa Barbara International Film Festival has become a big part of the work that we do in the department. Uh, Roger Durling, who's the executive director of the festival, is a regular instructor in our department, and I co-direct the student film competition for the film festival. So we have a really nice cross-pollination going on between the department here on campus and the work that they're doing at the festival. That's really good, thanks. Okay. Yes. Emily. Yeah, I took this course last year, and it was uh, eye-opening to say the least. I don't think I can ever look at a movie quite the same way. Um, I'm always in like analysis, you know, heavily. So I was, thank you for that. Uh, it was one of the, my f most uh, me memorable courses I've taken here at SBCC. So on behalf of the students, I thank you. And I think having this online option um, is incredible. So again, just opening those doors, keeping our access and our success within this institution. So thank you. Thank you very much. Else? Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, I think you'll, you won't mind if we all sign up. <laughs> no. <laughs> the audience as well <laughs> for your class. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Okay, um, now we have approval of minutes, and we have three sets of minutes, which I think we can take together. Uh, meetings of December 8th, December 15th, and January 12th um, of this year, and the other two were last year. So may I have a motion? I move approval of item 3.1. I'll second. Jonathan seconds. Any comments, questions, whatever? Angie, I think we made one change from the notice version.
But this is the K-12. K-12 representative. We double checked and you guys are co's. It's <laughs> fancy. Very fancy. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. They pass. And that takes us to public comment and coincidentally we have Carrie Matsuoka as our first person. Uh, we are honored to have Carrie who is the new superintendent of Santa Barbara Unified and welcome Carrie. Thank you. Uh, President Beebe and members of the board, I wanted to just take a few minutes and introduce myself before I'm on the job too long. Um, Dr. Beebe and I have been in our jobs the same amount of time, yep. six months and three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for both of us, it's been, I'm sure, a whirlwind. For me, it's uh, been a lot of learning, a lot of getting to know my district and also Santa Barbara community. So I just wanted to have a you know visual face. One of you I know really well. Um, Ms. Gallardo is uh, on staff with our district. Uh, observations about Santa Barbara Unified and City College. The, the level of partnerships between our two districts is unlike anything I've ever seen. And I've worked for districts mostly in Silicon Valley and I've worked you know, around some really great community colleges, but the degree of dual enrollment, um, pathways around career technical ed and just the partnerships is it's unprecedented. And I know Dr. Beebe and I share the same vision to continue and enhance those. Um, I landed as you were launching the Promise program. Uh, that's also, you know, uh, setting a new national standard. And um, with Mr. Green's work, uh, I'm excited for our students' current and future because affordability has become a huge barrier to go to college. And I think with our current political environment, I think providing a safe place, a secure place for students to go to school is super important. Uh, and who knows what's ahead? You know, we're working on that armory property as the K-12 district. I think there's an opportunity to discuss and share ideas about the use of that land. Um, it's right between Santa Barbara Junior High and the high school. Um, it's, it's a big piece of property and I think it offers opportunities for us to collaborate. So just wanted to say hi. Uh, thanks for the chance to see you all and I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Carrie. Thank you, so All right, we have a number of folks who want to um, take advantage of our public comment time period, and um, I have three different topics. So I'm going to divide them by topic and also give the people who want to talk to the resolution uh, number 17, which is I think item 7.2, an option to speak now in general, pub general public comment or wait through the rest of the agenda until we get to the item and speak before we vote. So think about your choice there. And um, I will start with Frank Rodriguez, who is uh, speaking to us from uh, CAUSE. everybody. There we go. So I was asked um, by Luz to come here today to talk about um, a campaign we've been working on to help tenants here in Santa Barbara. And so my name is Frank Rodriguez. I'm with the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Co Economy, an organization that historically worked with um, immigrant rights here in Santa Barbara. Hi, uh, my name is Max Golding. Uh, I'm a former City College student here. Uh, for several years, spanned at different times. I'm a marriage family therapist intern at Calm Child Abuse Listening and Mediation now. Um, and he's one of the people that was evicted by IV Apartments, which I'm gonna talk about right now. So like y'all know, and a lot of us know here, neighborhoods in the Santa Barbara West Side, historically affordable to low wage workers and immigrant families um, are in the midst of gent gentrification. And gentrification is the process of displacing lower income residents in order to improve housing so that it conforms to new higher income residents that are coming in. 
Um, and we saw this with Ivy Apartments, which was a unit of 50 unit apartment on Carrillo Street, just right going into the west side. Um, and it has evicted everybody there, people that have been living there for 20 years, for 30 years. And there's a report um, that I gave to Luce to give to y'all, which kind of talks about how this company has been operating. Um, and basically, they worked through acquisition. Um, and what they did is when they bought this apartment, they gave everyone a 60 day notice of eviction. Um, well, the way the law is here in Santa Barbara, there is no, um, there has to be no reason given for to, to evict somebody, unlike other cities like Los Angeles, like the Bay Area, which fought for a lot of rights, such as rent control, such as no cause eviction, um, I mean, just cause eviction, um, but we didn't have those wins here in the Central Coast. Um, and so what happened with this gentrification process, me, Kathy Murillo, and a member of the Rental Mediation Task Force just went there this last Friday. Um, there's around seven tenants still there. Um, all the families have been pushed out. Um, and this is an issue we started addressing as part of cause because the immigrant community said these evictions are the ones that are most concerning. Because when, when you're evicting uh, families that have kids um, in the K through 12 system, that means kids are sleeping in their cars, sleeping in family members' sofas as they find a new place to live. Um, I don't have to explain the housing crisis here in Santa Barbara. We know the vacancy rate is low. We know that it's extremely hard to find rent, um, a place to rent here in Santa Barbara. And so what we've been fighting for is to have city council put forward a tenant's rights protection ordinance, which they have already put on the agenda, which is awesome and we congratulate them. Um, also, Helene Schneider, the mayor, did come out um, and call out gentrification and calling out what that means. And gentrification is pushing out a community um, that I come from, the Spanish-speaking immigrant community. I grew up in the east side. And to see a lot of these family members being pushed out, that's extremely hard. My dad's back in Mexico. A lot of my family's in Texas because we know it's extremely hard to live here in Santa Barbara. Um, and so how we found out about this was we have leaders and cause that um, are part of the Spanish-speaking community, and they're the ones that found out about this eviction. When we went to go meet with them, these family members said they're moving to Florida. They said they're moving up to Washington um, because they can't afford to live here, and they don't have time to find those, um, those, those places to live right away. I just want um, him to talk, Garrett, to talk a little bit about how it felt being kicked out from Ivy Apartments. Um, I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll just try to be really brief. Um, so, uh, like a lot of other people, like student community people who come here to be students, um, I, went to, I went to a city college in the Bay Area where I'm from for two years, uh, so came here to SBCC, UCSB, back to SBCC, went to Antioch, got a master's degree. Um, like a lot of other students, we jump around from place to place. It's really hard to live in a place for more than six months to like two years or whatever and have any kind of stability. Um, I did end up living with a couple housemates. Uh, one is a current city college student here in Ivy Apartments. Uh, we were only there for a few months, and during that time, um, we were getting notices on our doors uh, for things that they were saying we were doing, um, which we weren't doing, but there were notices on every single door on the apartment unit. Uh, a few blocks away, there was another Ivy apartment. We'd, notice noti we'd see notices on the doors there, so there was this sort of systemic, uh, intentional you know, application of uh, pressure toward uh, people living in these apartment buildings of them saying, uh, you, you didn't pay your rent, we did pay our rent, um, we had to you know, prove that we sent our checks. They said, no, we didn't get the checks. Um, I, if I were more prepared, I had to run over here from work. Um, there is like a, there's a laundry list of, of complete, um, completely deceptive things that they were doing to pretty intentionally try to push us out, kick us out, uh, cause us so much anxiety and distress that we would probably leave. Um, and uh, as Frank's talking, is, is he talking about immigrant communities, big family, what lower, uh, lower income, um, working class Latino immigrant communities, uh, these families are, they made up the majority of these apartment buildings. Um, and me and my friends, you know, we have these, we have these safety nets. Um, we have friends, I have a master's degree, like I'm, I'm gonna be okay, you know, like I can get kicked out of an apartment like this and probably find um, an okay job and I don't have kids and stuff and I guess, um, the, the, the most troubling thing to me, especially working at Calm now, seeing the majority of our families are, um, are lower income, uh, Latino, Spanish speaking families that are just under a lot more stress than folks like me, uh, folks that look like me and that can kind of wear this costume and just like get away with stuff um, for how we look and, and whatnot. Um, it's just, it's a lot harder, I think, for them um, to be in this situation. And uh, I'm hoping that you guys can, uh, whatever you can do, uh, pressure the city council in a, in a no cause, uh, uh, eviction ordinance that I guess uh, cause is trying to pressure them to do and to um, 
try to support uh, students and families that are trying to just live in the community and um, especially because I think you guys kind of are not intentionally but you're part of the gentrification machine you're the reason like me and thousands of other people come to Santa Barbara that aren't from here um, that we incentivize for um, property owners to try to rent to us and push out other more vulnerable families so I do think that it, you do have a responsibility to try to um, do something to address that problem thanks The last thing, really quick, um, in our policy memo that we gave to y'all, we have our recommendations that we're giving to city council right now. Um, this uh, city attorney is creating the proposed ordinance that's going to be presented to city council in early March. Um, so we're hoping that it includes language like just cause, but he's fighting people like Dario Pini, who's a slumlord who's making people in our community have to choose that, you know, we might have to live with rats. Um, in our houses. So that's the kind of slumlord stuff that we need to fight habitability issues. So that's in our policy memo. Um, so we want you to support um, this uh, tenants rights ordinance as it comes to city council, but at the same time condemn um, or uh, companies like Ivy Apartments who come in and push out our community. This is the seventh time they've done this. Done this. Um, their locations are right next to, uh, to Cucas. They're on Cornell Street. They're right next to the Boys and Girls Club. They're in our community, so we really want it to be addressed. And thank you for your time. It's much appreciated. So. Frank? <laughs> Frank? I just, I, Frank? Um, I, I just wanted to thank you because uh, Cause has been very important in this community. When I tried to get a just cause eviction uh, ordinance going, people looked at me like I was, what, what am I talking about? So it took a little bit to get people understanding what it was on the city council to, to, to even think of it. So uh, I didn't get very far. So I really appreciate Cause um, and your kind of advocacy. Thank you. It's good. Yeah, I, and what's good right now, it's not just gonna be just cause on on the platform it's going to be everything okay. um, because we need to be holistic in the way we approach it but we do appreciate that you started that conversation because it, it's necessary people yeah. evictions are the face of gentrification um, it's the face of when we want to go talk to these families and they're being pushed out um, and they're targeting to go to, to college students right so we just want to make sure that we're critical we have these difficult conversations and how do we the academic institutions make sure we can house these students and at the same time um, celebrate and try to keep the vibrant diverse communities we do have in Santa Barbara okay but I wasn't supposed to give you another minute sorry <laughs> <laughs> but thank you that's all right thank we you, can ask you. questions no, so anybody thank else have any comments or questions yeah, okay. quick Jonathan question. um, what do you think you know specifically our board should do um, one is condemn Ivy apartments um, this is not the type of gentrification we need to see um, and so what they did is they gave everyone a 60-day notice to be evicted between December 16th and January 6th those are exactly during the holidays um, all the families I talked to I talked to a total of 20 families and all of them had children in K through 12 system um, they raised the rent on January 1st from 1345 to almost nineteen hundred dollars um, so this is, um, and what they do is they fix up the apartments. When they're fixing it up, they're painting it, maybe changing some, tu some tubing, but people are still living there as they're doing this construction. Um, so they're just, when I made the statement that they're making it fit to the, to the different class, the middle class or the higher class that's gonna move into these apartments, um, that's direct blatant gentrification, something that a just cause ordinance can address. Um, but at the same time, I think it would be awesome if y'all can just condemn that kind of stuff. We don't want that to happen. We do, what we want to improve our communities, but that doesn't mean pushing out our communities, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just so you know, we're, our, the way our agenda works, we can't take action based on public comment, but we can put it on a later agenda for discussion and or action, so. Yeah. Thank, cool. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we have three folks who want to speak on students and housing, and um, I think that's a topic that we can cover now in general public comment. So, um, first person I have is McKinley Kovats, and that's followed by Maggie Hodgkins and Kevin McCabe. Hi, I'm Kevin McCabe. 
I'm Maggie Hodgins. And I'm McKinley Kovacs. Um, we're here on behalf of SBCC Students for Housing, an activist club, club on campus. We plan on engaging students and the local community to address student housing issues. With that being said, we acknowledge one of the board's 2016-2017 goal is to, quote, support efforts to explore the issue of student housing and workforce housing and learn about them, unquote. And we believe a formal needs assessment of our community will be beneficial in collecting data so we can develop an effective plan to address the student housing in our local community. As McKinley mentioned, our club's intention is <clears throat> sorry, our club's intention is for the, this upcoming year to raise awareness for student housing in our local community. And we hope that we join forces with the Board of Trustees um, in the exploration of purpose-built student housing. Thank you. Any questions? No, but we have to thank you for doing part of our goal which our goal was to find out about student housing, so thank yeah. you. Yeah, so we're here and we're hoping that we can join forces with you guys to do more exploration since we're almost halfway through the year. Thank you. Do, you, do, you have, do you have specific plans by which you um, hope to acquire data that will be informing your, your outcome? Sure, so as, the, as a club, what we're hoping to do, and also as a, as a club, what we're hoping to do um, is put out an informal um, data um, survey to our students, just asking like simple questions like, you know, how many people live in your live in your unit? How much are you paying? Um, simple questions like that, and then from there, we hope to have like a formal um, survey collected um, on behalf of all of our students. That way, we can understand the the needs. Because um, as we saw from our former speaker, that there clearly is a housing crisis um, directed to students as well. So that's what we're doing, just being more, um, bringing more awareness here on campus um, as a club. And we're also all members of um, our associated student government. So we also hope to um, work for student housing on behalf of them as well. Yeah. Wish you well. Thank you. Thank we you. hope to be working with you, so thank you. <laughs> we want to drop us well. But we want to drop the, the, the word survey monkey. Say that again? Survey monkey. Do you know about survey monkey? I don't. Okay, we'll talk. All <laughs> right, sounds good, Marty. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, we now have 10. Uh, people who want to speak on the resolution, which is Resolution 17 uh, for student success. And as I mentioned earlier, if you want or need, because you might have a class, to speak now during public comment, you are welcome to do so. Otherwise, I will hold them until we get to uh, the actual agenda item. And we're going, because we have 10 people, we're going to go to the two minutes per person uh, time frame. So does anyone want to speak now? Okay, we'll wait. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Sure, please come. And your name is? Press. Okay. Press. Um, how you doing, uh, members of the board? President, uh, my name is Juan Perez. I'm currently taking classes right here in uh, CC, and then uh, I just want to uh, make a comment that what is for me to be a, a, a student in the City College, for me is to be, uh, is to have a voice of, uh, on a community that from, the, from, uh, uh, from people from different places, and then uh, I feel like uh, I can achieve anything I want because I'm surrounded of a lot of people that give me courage to do it. And uh, I, I have met a lot of people 
that I can learn a lot from them and uh, have give me advice. And then uh, uh, just a little bit of background about myself is that I started learning Spanish, I mean English on uh, ESL Wake Center in Golira. And then uh, I, I finished to level five and then I take in, uh, ESL classes right here and now um, I'm taking a uh, argumentation and debate uh, class and then uh, Math 107 and a philosophy class. And everything that I'm learning here is, uh, is uh, like a different world because my perspective has been changing. And um, I just want to say that uh, when one part of the community, uh, as I feel a part of the community, if you, as I think that's, this college is about, when we're putting aside one community, that sense is lost. And then I think we have to keep it that way. And then uh, so, and then right here I'm, I'm learning to be a reasonable, a reasonable, a reasonable man that um, is gonna, uh, it's gonna change the, the when I don't have to listen to fear, fear or anything because it becomes uh, so it becomes a, a irrationality. So and then so I, I lost the sense of reality and then um, I don't know what to do. So I try to keep re reasoning and then listening to um, to to something that can make me a better person. And then, so um, this is all I just want to share. Uh, I have a class right now at six. Oh. So, <laughs> and thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, President Bibi, members of the board, community, faculty, staff. Uh, my name is Dr. Luis Giraldo. I work here as the Director of Equity on Campus. And I have the words of uh, Paulo Freire in my mind as I'm listening to, to the student, and I commend you for coming up and speaking. He's one of our leaders. He's actually part of our committee. And Paulo Freire talks about authentic help and what that means. And, and, and I, when I think about that, and his quote is, Authentic help means that all who are involved help each other mutually, growing together in the common effort to understand the reality which they seek to transform. And I think that's, that's the work that you do. You're, you're seeking to transform the reality that impacts so many of us, right? Um, and, and particularly our students. So as I was listening to um, the housing issues and, and I'm listening to students speak to me about what their fears are during these times, um, I think unique times require unique solutions, and these solutions are in our hands as administrators, as the board. And so my call to, to everyone is to think about you know, how we're impacting our students and the decisions that we're making. How can they resist and push back against the, the times that we're living? Um, students like Juan and many others are struggling and, and um, scared, right? They come into our offices saying, I feel that I don't belong on this campus. And what we all stand for is a campus that is inclusive of all people. And so with that thought, I, I turn to you and say, please consider this, these students and, and, and my words and the words of, of the folks that will speak today on, on, on behalf of the things that are happening on our campus and the decisions that you have on your hands um, to, to create and continue to push for a campus that is inclusive of individuals and students like the young man that just spoke, who is a leader on, not only on this campus but in our community. So I commend you for your work and I ask you to please consider that as, you, as we move forward with this meeting. Thank you. Okay, we'll reserve the other speakers for when we get to the agenda item. Um, we now have reports from uh, various groups on campus, and our first one is Lori Vasquez reporting on Academic Senate. Good evening, board members and Superintendent President Beebe and audience members. As with many groups right now, the Academic Senate is struggling with the challenge of determining an appropriate response given the current political rhetoric and the climate it creates for our students. 
The Senate is looking at the State Academic Senate President's statement, which advocates for thoughtful and deliberative discourse where diverse perspectives are respected and honored, and further calls for faculty to commit to serving others through actions characterized by inclusion, civility, and respect. The Chancellor's Office press release affirms the values of inclusiveness and diversity following the presidential election. Most recently, we have been reviewing the Board of Governors resolution that in part states that all 113 community colleges remain open, safe, and welcoming to all students. The faculty have been involved in extensive dialogue about the impact of the election on our students and how to maintain a learning environment that supports all SBCC students. These conversations have occurred at our faculty in-service event on January 13th, at our division meetings, and over multiple meetings of the Academic Senate. We expect that the conversation will be ongoing as we look for ways to affirm the value we place on all of our students and the commitment we have to their success, regardless of background. In addition to this critically important conversation, we have also been reviewing the college's draft vision statements. We have discussed ways to better assist students in adding classes and finding late start classes, and have been considering possible participation in the California Guided Pathways Initiative, which could help students reach educational goals more efficiently. This spring promises to be a busy semester with many important topics and actions taken which may have a long-term impact on the college. We, now, we know that now is a critical time when the voice of faculty is especially important and we, we remain committed to weighing in on issues which influence the experience of our students as they work toward achieving their educational and life goals. And that is the Senate report. Thank you, Laurie. Any questions? Uh, do we have a report, Dylan? Raymond? Is Dylan here? I don't think I saw him. I don't see Dylan. No, I don't see him. Okay. Um, so we'll skip the report by associated students for this meeting. Um, and that takes us to classified staff. Liz, auction class. Good afternoon, members of the board, uh, President Beebe. The consultation group hasn't met yet. We wait till the next CPC meeting, but CSEA has met and we've been working on one of the first of the reorganizations, the one for facilities and operations. We're working on that one first because out of four supervisors, two of them are gone and won't be replaced. So there's some reorganization that needs to be done and that's almost completed. It should come to you fairly soon. We've been also working on our yearly um, reclassification process. This is one of the only ones that I know of in the state. After we did our full classification study in 2005, we were able to um, agree to and implement a process to keep it up. And so every year we have an open period where people can submit the reclassification. The committee gets together and analyzes them all and decides which ones are merited and maybe which ones aren't. But we're just about through with that process too. So hopefully that will be coming to you fairly soon. So, and our, even though we don't, haven't had a consultation meeting, I have sent out the vision statement to the different members, and they've been pleased with what the committee has come up with so far, so they are, they are supportive of the new vision statement. Any questions? Can I just, I, I'm talking too much, maybe I had too much uh, caffeine, but, but I have, do have a question. Um, the, I'm kind of blown away a little bit to know that the reclassification uh, requests are not Normal. I thought that was a normal thing. No, it's we not. do. I mean, it's just so logical. So before we had our 2005 reclassification study, it had been over 30 years before people had gone through any reclassifications at all. Wow. It's not. It's something that most uh, colleges seem to have a hard time agreeing on the process, and we were able to come up with a process that was was acceptable to both the district and to CSEA, and so that's not something that uh, happens. I'm not sure it's happened with any other community college. They will do the classification study, but then they don't put in a process to maintain it. So in another five to 10 years, it's all out of whack again. And, we, and that's what happened 30 years before our last one. So in order for us to do a process, that was something real exceptional for us that we were able, and we've uh, 
pr done that process every year since I think it, we finally decided one in 2008, and we've done it every year since then. Yeah. No, it's just so logical. I mean, it, it is, but it's you get mired in a classification you don't want to be in or something. It's just well, it's what happens in a that. classification is your work changes slowly. Yeah. You it, you it, it kind of slowly over the years. So after maybe a couple of years, you may have taken on new duties, especially the way the technology changes and how the life just changes on the campus. Yeah. So we were able to get a process so we could recognize that. I think it's wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Any more questions? I want to give compliments, too, uh, related to that reclassification process to Vice President English, uh, who's worked very closely with Liz on all of that in the, in the panel. Um, okay, it's your turn, Anthony. Oh, okay. I just want to spend uh, a little bit of time uh, talking about Governor Brown's preliminary budget. He released it on January 10th, and, and there's going to be changes uh, between now and the, the May revise. Um, but just high level, from his perspective, um, with the, the new Trump administration, he suggested that there's likely going to be some policy changes that will affect the, the state budget. And uh, it's too early for, for him to speculate what those changes might be, when they might take place, um, and those kinds of things. So uh, he's really taking kind of a wait and see approach. Uh, the governor did, did mention that from his perspective, this is gonna be um, one of the toughest budgets that uh, he's put together since 2012. And the reason for that is that we, we in California have been on a very slow and uh, prolonged uh, economic recovery. And actually, we're entering our eighth year of that recovery. Um, the average recovery cycle has typically been five years. And so the reason for that discussion has to do with the idea that um, the potential for an economic downturn is very likely when you've had that long of a of uh, economic expansion. Um, so for, for a lot of these reasons, Governor Brown um, is taking a very conservative approach with his budget, and uh, some have called it kind of a plain vanilla uh, budget at this point, or, or what's called also a, a COLA budget, cost of living uh, allowance budget. Um, but in any case, it's a very cautionary budget. I think that's the way I would kind of frame it. Um, there are a few things in here that I wanted to point out in the preliminary budget in terms of COLA for the unrestrict, unrestricted general fund for Santa Barbara City College. We're looking at a bill, about a million eighty thousand uh, dollars for that. COLA for restricted funds is probably about sixty-two thousand dollars, according to our estimate. Um, increased operating expenses. These are primarily related to the PERS STRS retirement. Um, we're looking at about 271,000 for Santa Barbara City College. And then the last item I wanted to talk about was the deferred maintenance, which is uh, a one-time amount, but we're looking at about a half a million dollars for Santa Barbara City College. Um, and then there's some other areas as well, but for the most part, those are, those are the primary ones. So that's, that's the end of my report. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Um, we now go to report from board members, and um, this is a test because we appointed representatives earlier this year, and uh, I thought it would be a good thing to make sure we keep up with what's going on. So I've listed here reports from our different representatives. Now, that does not mean you have to have accomplished something immediately, but if you have plans or you're in process with something, feel free to tell us about it. So let's start with our K-12 representatives. So I think this is a neat, um, you know, we've talked about adult ed. And so we, why should not we? Actually, we didn't do anything. We kind of just facilitate great people at the college that are already heading, spearheading great work. And so Dean Evans is sort of taking this big community and trying to break it up and listen and say, what are some of those needs around CTE? Well, we had an opportunity to connect him with uh, Casey Kilgore on the East Side, which if you know the East Side, Franklin, it's pretty much operating like a nonprofit when you look at just the number of services that are going through there. Um, our, 
EOPS office, um, I'm sure Marcia, the EOPS folks can speak, but they're on the campus with the service center. So we had an opportunity to really talk about what can we do in the area of CTE um, not to say that everybody's going to come here and transfer, get a degree, but what can we do in the area of career enhancements for that community? Um, and so just think got to hear a lot of great ideas. You know, hearing from Mr. Matsuoka with that armory there, we're a small community. If they went out for millions of dollars for a bond and they have this amazing facility and he's saying, let's work together, then that should be a no-brainer for us to say, yes, let's go do that. Let's not ask then our taxpayers again to fund something else. Um, so I think just keeping these conversations going is gonna be important. Um, Dr. Beebe has tasked Dean with this great work that he's gracefully doing. And so I think that as we continue to reach out into our community and see what we can do, um, it's, especially in Carpinteria, we haven't gotten there yet, but I think this is a great way to start because we know with this Career Skills Institute, that's taking off. But now this is sort of a segment in our community that we haven't heard from in the past. Um, and we've talked a lot about if you change the SES of the household, you're gonna automatically change the trajectory of that student in that household, just from a literacy standpoint, um, the zero to three, zero to eight, um, which really sets the foundation for lifelong learning. Great, thank you. Um, and I guess you get another turn because you're our SPCC Foundation representative. Um, nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> Other than you guys did attend the two events of the foundation, I did not because it was during school. And so, okay, can't leave those kids alone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the uh, ad hoc mitigation committee, um, I'll cover that. Uh, the committee met with the Santa Barbara Housing Authority before Christmas, um, before the holiday break, and um, I think it was a good discussion. Uh, Anthony attended as well, and Jeff, um, and we kind of gained some of their perspective on the difficulty uh, that they see in housing, um, which, among other things, is an extraordinarily low vacancy rate uh, for the city and for the, probably for the area. And the other piece I think that um, particularly stood out was an interest in collecting more data to understand this situation. Now we've had our student speakers touch on that, but Jeff was also kind enough to suggest that we might be able to get uh, a study going, uh, a full-fledged study going to really uh, gather more information about this, and I think it would include issues like um, the the problems of gentrification that Frank Rodriguez brought up with the uh, pushing out of some of our uh, less advantaged and underrepresented parts of our community uh, and moving in a direction that uh, I, for one, would hope we can support those students not push them out to Florida and other places. So um, that's, uh, that's a topic we covered with that meeting. And we planned some meetings where Angie is working on meetings with Janet Wolf, Joan Hartman, Dias Williams, um, the Student Senate, and an internal meeting so we can come back to you with some recommendations. Um, next, we have the Community Partnership Ad Hoc Committee. I think Peter had the lead on that. I wanted to touch on the, that meeting that you just referenced before. And what I came away with was a sense, an increased sense of the amazing complexity of, of the issue uh, dealing with housing. Um, it isn't just a single factor that will, that will cause us to understand the thing. So I was very grateful for the, uh, for the opportunity to meet and, and for the need for data. Uh, we're, we're, we're speaking uh, as if we actually know what we're talking about. But what became very clear was we need, we need to go after hard data about housing, about who moves here, why they move here, how many people per apartment, and what the, what the rents are, and so forth. Um, uh, I was also impressed by the passion of the of uh, the administrator in supporting and hoping that we would support some form of just cause uh, 
process by which evictions are, are, are uh, happening, rather than allowing them to go as was described earlier. Um, and what was the other thing you wanted me to talk about? <laughs> the Community Partnership Ad Hoc Committee, which was going to define its mission. Well, we, I think, are still in the defining stage. That's fair. <laughs> So the warning is that we'll continue to list these items. It's rather like we used to have where we had subcommittee reports, except um, we will have reports from our various representatives. And I have forgotten legislation. Yes. And Jonathan, I don't know how I dropped that. So it's you're up. <laughs> um, so I, the main thing I've done is I've went and looked at every college, uh, community college in California that has a legislative agenda and looked at their process of putting it together and like the kinds of things they look at. That's been very fruitful. Uh, De Anza Foothill College had the best model that I think I'm gonna go off of and come up with the draft for the next meeting, but my analysis of the state budget is the same as Anthony's, so it's cautionary is a good word for it. But there are bills in the pipeline that are not directly about the budget, but that affect us that we could be commenting on. So I'll put together the list for the next meeting and also a process. And you know, it, if anything, I you know, long-term goal. I think we can start commenting proactively. So right now, I think this year we do. You know, this bill is good. This bill is bad, et cetera. But as we change and develop, I think with the enrollment management, we've talked about this a little bit. That the way the state funds us is not ideal. Maybe one day we can get to the point of proposing changes to that. So that's my personal long-term vision for that. Good. Um, and uh, I also have one other item that I can bring up, um, well, two. One is a number of us were able to go to the kickoff, and I think that was a great experience. For, and thank you always for everyone who participated in that. Um, and the other is that uh, today I attended the Affordable Housing Task Force meeting, which meets quarterly. And um, that is a group that encompasses Goleta, uh, Carpinteria, and Santa Barbara, and talks about affordable housing issues. And it's, um, today's topic was quite interesting. Apparently, there is state legislation, which has just, as of January 1, uh, wiped off the local books a lot of requirements relating to um, what you would, what you might call, well, it's, uh, I'm not good at the technical terms, but it's when you have an additional house, small house on your property, if you're in a residential neighborhood, um, there traditionally have been in a lot of limitations on whether or not you could have an actual house, a rental, and so forth. The state has gotten tired of that and wiped a lot of these requirements off the book, effective January 1, and um, so it is theoretically at least a lot easier to do that and many of the ones that exist but are not officially real, are not on the books, may also be in a position to come forward and become legal through this process. But it's apparently a, if you wanna build one of these, anywhere between 70 square feet, extremely small, to 1,200 square feet, um, it's uh, supposed to be a yes or no on the permit, ministerial only, nothing fancy, uh, within 120 days. So it's a big change, uh, and everyone at the meeting was digesting it, <laughs> shall we say. So. Um, okay, we have done the report of sabbatical out outcomes from Michael, and we now go to the naming opportunity, Jeff. So while Jeff walks down here, this is the second visit that we've had on the item of this naming opportunity by Jack and Julie Nadell, School of Business and Entrepreneurship. And I just want to thank uh, Jeff again for his leadership on this particular topic. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, as, as Dr. Beebe said, this was what we discussed two weeks ago. So uh, good evening. I'm, well, I'm happy to be back. This is, this is actually, uh, it's, I love it when a plan comes together. Wasn't that the... Uh, 
<laughs> Sorry, that's 80s. Um, <laughs> uh, this is the culmination of a, a long-standing conversation. I also want to acknowledge that our Dean, uh, Melissa Moreno, is here. Uh, and Melissa and I actually were at uh, Julie Nadell's home this afternoon speaking with her about the, the final details. Uh, she uh, unfortunately couldn't join us tonight, but is aware that um, we're having this conversation and is looking forward to your um, approval of this opportunity. Um, I included a memo in your packet, so I think you have all the highlights of what uh, is, is at stake here, but I'll just say verbally a very short version of that. We have been offered a $1 million gift. Um, this would be a $1 million cash gift over the next five years to establish an endowment. Uh, and as part of this gift, we would be um, proposing to rename our School of Business and Entrepreneurship the Jack and Julie Nadell School of Business and Entrepreneurship. It would include all programs uh, under uh, that, that umbrella and all overseen by Dean Melissa Moreno at this moment in time. Uh, the idea is that this would be an unrestricted endowment that would be used for the highest need any given year. That, that highest need would be determined um, jointly by the dean overseeing the programs and the president superintendent of the college. Uh, the actual lobby of the BC building, as we now call it, uh, would be remodeled, uh, upgraded for better student use, especially for the entrepreneurship program. So it's a place of collaboration. It is a small space, but we got a first look today. We're bringing on Don Ziemer as a designer to do this, someone who has been a longtime supporter and designer of many places on the campus. And uh, everyone really liked what they saw. So we, we have the, the dollars, and the good news is, um, uh, Melissa, with, with uh, Dr. Uh, Jarrell's uh, support, have identified uh, about $100,000 of grant funds that could be used to do the actual renovation. So the, the full $1 million piece would come into the foundation and would follow all of our normal procedures for the establishment of an endowment that would be used in perpetuity. So that is what's before you today. I would be the first uh, significant naming opportunity in, in many years here, and I, I hope the actually beginning of a new trend. Uh, and uh, I think this is a great signal to the community as well that this is a place um, that you can invest significant resources uh, and do a lot of good for the, the current and future generations of students. So I'm happy to ask any questions, but I, I think most of what we talked about is is on the table. Anyone questions? Well, I think it's just terrific, Jeff, and I think we find ourselves thanking you and the Foundation Board and the Foundation staff and Anthony and Melissa and, um, what, 10 other people who helped us do this? Absolutely. And again, I didn't say, I said it last time, I'll say it again. This is really the perfect uh, poster example of what strong development at a community college can be because this was really led by faculty relationships uh, and, and the foundation simply stepped in at the end to, to bring it to closure. But really this is about the, the relationships that you and your, your faculty already have. But also about the relationship between the college and the foundation Absolutely. working together. And, and we appreciate that. Sure. So thank you. Thank you. That's good. All right. Well, may I have a motion to approve the naming opportunity? I so Greg, move. Peter second. Any comments, questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Who May is there be you. many more. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I got to see Melissa's smile right now. That's what I need to see. <laughs> yeah, that, we, got a picture um, that. we will be inviting Julie Nadell. We did invite her tonight. Actually, she was unable to join yeah. us, but um, I will be meeting with her early next week, and uh, we will invite her, find a time for her to come and, and say hello and get to meet you all okay. as well. And Jeff, do convey our thanks because we Absolutely. really appreciate it. This is a wonderful, wonderful gift for us. And we Thank hardly you. ever vote all seven. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we do that all the time. But no, this is just really amazing. Thank and you. I hope we get to do a little ribbon cutting or something. I miss those. Oh, yeah, actually, uh, now that you bring that up, yes. Marty. Uh, uh, September 28th, we have tentatively started to explore as a date for ribbon cutting and dedication for the actual space. Um, and so we'll obviously follow up. There's a lot of questions to be asked between now and then, but we're hoping that that, that will be a, that's the time frame we're looking at. Okay. So, Thank cool. you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. We are now on um, item 7.2, resolution number 17, student success support for all students. Um, Anthony, do you want to comment first? Yeah, I would. Uh, just very, very briefly, this is really a recommitment um, of, the, of our board and of the college um, to student success for all students. And I, I really don't want to take uh, any time or, or, or anything away from Trustee Abood. Um, this is really something that has been sparked by him and uh, 
some of his constituency. So I think I'm just going to turn it over to you, Trustee Abood. Yeah. So thanks for let's see, for hearing this today, and I'm I'm glad we get to be talking about this. I've brought it up a couple times at a few other board meetings, and we talked about it a little bit at the conference right after the election. Um, I really believe that this resolution is necessary. Um, the current climate nationally does have very real effects locally, and that's why we have to be acting in the opposite direction, especially after the decisions this morning and yesterday uh, by the administration. So I think that this resolution just sends a strong and clear statement, uh, especially to our undocumented students, that we're on their side and that we care and we value their education and we have their back. And you know, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And you know, it, like I said, it might seem obvious that we support them, but I think the unique circumstances call for a, another statement or a clear statement. And then I want to say that this institution is focused and the point of SBCC is to lift people up and to give opportunity to people who don't have any or don't have very much. And I think this resolution builds into that greater movement of justice for these marginalized communities. And you know, we're standing alongside other groups like SBUSD, who did it in December, Oxnard Union, who did it, I think, in December as well. And I think we can continue to build that you know, movement and image and united front that this area, California, is a place for everyone and not just a few people. And you know, Governor Jerry Brown on Wednesday at the State of the State address, he made a very strong declaration. He got really heated. Um, if anyone saw the video, and he said very clearly that we're not going to leave any man, woman, or child behind. Um, so I think that by doing this, we also make it clear to students who have not enrolled yet uh, that this is a place to go. Uh, the example is, let's say Fresno Community College. I don't want to single them out. I just the first one that came into my head. Uh, let's say they don't pass something like this, but then we do. I think that sends a message to people that SBCC is a better place to go. Um, I think we can get those high achieving students to come here who, you know, they might feel more comfortable here than a community college that didn't take action. So that's another reason to, do, to be doing this. And lastly, I don't really think uh, we're at any undue legal risk by doing this. Um, you know, it states that we're not going to proactively provide any information or cooperate uh, proactively. So, you know, just handing it off for any protected class. Um, we're not using the word sanctuary on purpose, uh, and we don't have a police department, so that's the prime focus of most of those kinds of resolutions. But um, I think you know, there's, I think we have the state on our side on this. We have the community college system on our side, the UC, the CSU. So I think if anything were to happen, uh, we are in good company. And I think by doing this, we show the state that we're open to more aggressive measures. So things like Senate Bill 54, which would be making clear requirements uh, that say we cannot provide, you know, hold certain information on students. By doing something like this, it shows the state leadership that there is a groundswell, grassroots support to pass things like that and to be more aggressive as a state as a whole. So that's all I have to say on the matter. Thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing the public comment and board discussion. Okay. Um, we're going to have a series of public comment now on this resolution before we vote. and. Um, the one thing I would like to ask people to do is hold their applause because um, much as there is great passion, and Jonathan has amply expressed it, um, for these ideas, we are an institution that believes in diversity of ideas as well as diversity of people. And it is important for us to respect the fact that there are diverse viewpoints on this. Clearly, this country is having to struggle with that particular fact. And um, those diverse viewpoints exist in California as well. So I don't want to unduly pressure anyone, um, but we do want to hear from you. And we are happy to hear from each person who wants to speak. I just don't want anyone to feel that they are um, reluctant to speak because they may not have the most popular viewpoint or the greatest applause. So please hold your applause and let's listen to the folks who want to talk with us. Uh, first person I have is Stephanie Ramirez. Uh, 
um, president, members of the board. My name is um, Stephanie Ramirez. I am undocumented, and I am a proud Santa Barbara City College graduate. Uh, with the support and guidance of the wonderful counselors and professors here at Santa Barbara City College, I accomplished my goal of transferring to a four-year university, and this past June, I earned my bachelor's degree from UCLA. As someone who walked through this campus and previously sat in this exact classroom in Dr. Eskandari's political science class, uh, I am here to ask you to vote in support of Resolution 17. Please take into account that undocumented students are currently undergoing fear, uncertainty, and a whole lot of stress. I spoke to my brother last night, um, a, freshman and, a freshman at San Francisco State University, um, who shared with me a very honest and genuine comment that he does not feel welcomed in this country anymore. My heart broke hearing that the place that he has called home for the past 13 years um, is now a place that he feels threatened and unsafe. Please do not allow the negative rhetoric coming from the national level to penetrate through our academic institution. Everyone has the right to feel secure while learning. This hateful, this hateful narrative that criminalizes and dehumanizes immigrants does not belong in academic institutions. And that is why Santa Barbara Unified School District voted to make all of our schools a safe space in December. Be vocal about the support that this campus offers to vulnerable populations of students. Students that are simply here pursuing an education and wanting a better future for themselves. The success of a student is highly influenced by how safe an env their environment is. And for this reason, I urge you to vote yes on the resolution to make Santa Barbara City College a safe space for undocumented students. Thank you. Please. Please, I know it's tempting, but um, Gracie McEwen, I'm sorry I'm not reading your um, writing very, I think it's Huerta? Yeah. There's only one Grace. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I apologize, Gracie. Good afternoon, thank you so much. Um, I am blessed to be a product of Santa Barbara School District um, and Santa Barbara City College. I have been attending Santa Barbara City College, Wake, Schultz Center um, for many, many years. And I have always felt safe here, uh, whether it be the lighting or the handrails or um, the staff that I have encountered and who has supported me over the years. And I am here in support for all students to have that sense of safety. Um, we want people to feel safe based on religion, race, their um, national, their age, their gender, their abilities and disabilities. Um, I thank you for all the work that you've done in the past and I encourage you to continue doing that for the students in the future. I think everybody in Santa Barbara benefits when we're educated engaged and supported and um, I want to be a part of that community that educates and engages and supports all. Thank you. Fernando Calderon. just personal, this is a personal story uh, from an immigrant who came to this country. Um, my name is Fernando Calderon. I moved to Santa Barbara in 1990 with my wife and two children when I was offered a job as manager of information systems at UC UCSB. I am now retired. In 2000, an 18-year-old named Alex started coming to our home because he was a good friend of one of my children. 
He was a brilliant, kind, and a sensitive young man who talked about wanting to become a vet, uh, veterinarian. He told me that he had been brought to this country when he was a little boy illegally. He told me how difficult it was for him to try to get ahead and was constantly fearful of being deported. He said that he had started to cut himself years ago. They would fall into a deep depression and turn to alcohol to relieve his pain and anxiety. At his home, he did not have a room of his own to study. He slept on the sofa in the living room. I asked him to come to live with us because we had an extra bedroom and I was going to try to help him in any way that I could. He moved away six months later and was living with a friend. He enrolled here at City College with forged papers, forged papers, but I felt hopeful for him. In November of 2001, two sheriffs came to my home and asked if I knew Alex. They said that he had committed suicide. By hanging himself at a school playground in the middle of the night, they found my address in his pocket. He was 19. In 1991, I had a call from the principal of La Colina Junior High School where my son was in the seventh grade. <clears throat> the principal told me that my son had been beaten up and to come right away. When I got there, I saw my son bleeding from his mouth and his face was swollen. The principal told me that he had been at attacked by a group of skinheads at the school. I said, did you say skinheads? You mean that neo-Nazi hate group? He said, yes. I asked him, where do children learn to hate this way? Why can't our children feel safe at school? As I walked out holding my son's hand, I told him that this experience would teach him to, what not to do, to be careful of the words that he uses and to try to help other people. I came to this country when I was seven from Nicaragua in Central America, legally. I was enrolled in school right away and had the experience of millions of others who, didn't, who do not know the language and do the best that they can. While in the second grade, I walked out of a school building and was assaulted by eight or nine much older boys. I did not see the punch that hit me in the solar plexus as I doubled over. While I was on the ground, I was kicked in the face, head, ribs, and one of the boys was jumping in one of my kneecaps. When they finally stopped, they were laughing and yelling things in English that I, that I didn't understand. As I tried to get up, I had a gag reflex and I vomited all over myself from the pain. That was just the first time where I encountered hatred like that. After high school, I enrolled at Los Angeles City College, then transferred to Cal State LA, where I received a, a degree in computer science. After I graduated, I went to work for NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Having the benefit of quality public education gave me the opportunity to have the American dream, even building my own home here in Santa Barbara. As an immigrant, I have always felt that I was in someone else's home and that I had to treat that home with respect and appreciation. I also felt the need to give back. I started tutoring and coaching when I was in ninth grade and I have never stopped volunteering in the communities where I, where I lived. Even this morning, I was volunteering at the rescue mission downtown where I tutor computer classes and help those in recovery for alcohol and drug abuse. I also have uh, advised many of those people to, to apply here and help them even starting through the pipeline system. I taught computer classes in English and Spanish through the adult ed program for 10 years at the Wake Center. These are my experiences, probably similar to millions of others. These are not alternative facts. Also, what are not alternative facts is the cheap labor that is used to harvest the foods we eat, the cheap labor that provides the services that tourists who visit Santa Barbara use and help our, that help our local economy. This institution here has helped thousands who have stood on the shoulders of their families to peek out to see the possibilities of what an education and hard work can accomplish, that they too can contribute and have a voice, a voice Then my, <clears throat> then my friend Alex that I did not have. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Susan Epstein. Good afternoon, members of the board and President Beebe. It's great to see so many 
uh, friends here on the board and also in this room. Um, I want to thank Trustee Abood for bringing uh, this resolution. I think it's very important. Uh, my name's Susan Epstein, and I'm here speaking from a few different perspectives. Uh, I've taken classes at City College. Both of my, stu my children are currently enrolled at City College. Um, they started that in ninth grade, and I'm grateful for your program that makes that um, possible for so many of our high school students. Um, I'm also here because I'm, like you, an elected official uh, at a public education institution. And I know um, that it's hard to uh, make decisions sometimes that um, you can, you see so many different factors. You're looking at financial factors, you're looking at how to um, bring the most services to the most students. There's a lot of considerations. And um, I think it's really important um, for you to think about how people are going to look at this time in America in 30 years. Um, when we think about Japanese internment in World War II or Jim Crow laws, um, where there were separate parks and schools for whites and blacks, today our heroes are those who stood up, not those who complied. And sometimes compliance seems like the easy solution in the short term, but I want you to think about what you're going to tell your grandchildren when they ask, where were you? You know, you were, you were a trustee at City College. Did this issue come to you? I think, um, there, I, I imagine that you, you choose to do elected office. You're not here for the money. <laughs> I know that. Um, you're here because you, you care, because you want to bring great education to the most people, because you think every student has the right to have a great college education. And I want to respectfully ask you to think hard about that and make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Clarissa, Clarissa Erzoz. Hello, my name is Clarissa, and I'm here in support of Resolution 17. Um, what I want to touch on today specifically is um, the groups, not only locally, but also at the state level, um, who have also taken a similar stance that this resolution proposes to you today. The first is the Santa Barbara United School District, which passed a similar resolution um, in support of our students. The UC, CSU, and CC leadership wrote a letter after the election in support of our, our undocumented students and in support of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the DACA program. The CCC chancellor released a statement encouraging districts um, to not share private student records without a subpoena, a judicial warrant, or a court order, and to not cooperate with federal efforts to create registries um, of protected classes. State leaders like Kevin DeLeon, Speaker Anthony Rendon, Attorney General Xavier Becerra, Governor Jerry Brown, as well as our local officials such as Monique Limone and Hannah Beth Jackson have also publicly taken a stance um, to do everything possible to support our immigrant community. And finally, our um, local Santa Barbara Police Department has also stated that they will not detain undocumented individuals. Um, so I hope that this these actions already taken by local and um, state officials, as well as groups, can um, encourage you on this board to also support Resolution 17. Thank you. Thank you, Clarissa. Catherine Swison. Members of the board, President Bibi, my name is Catherine Swisson and I'm the president of the Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee. And I'm here on behalf of our organization to support resolution number 17. Our group is dedicated to furthering gender equality and other feminist values, including inclusiveness and respect for all, through social actions, political action, and educational programs. Our organization is one of the largest women's organization, political organization in Santa Barbara County. We have a diverse set of policy papers, including on educational uh, equity, uh, racism, and immigration. 
our educational equity position uh, advocate equity, bias-free education, fair and responsible funding for all levels of education. We are also committed to the elimination of barriers that impede girls and women from obtaining quality public education. And we support and advocate for policies that promote greater access to higher education for women and other underrepresented populations. Regarding racism, we strongly believe that genuine equality of opportunity for all in all spheres is fundamental to the eradication of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. On immigration, we support equal protection under the law for all people, regardless of immigration status. We want to keep all avenues of public education open to immigrants and their families. We oppose unlawful questioning of children in schools by teachers or school officials, detention of undocumented immigrants without due process, or policies that allow local law enforcement officers to act as ICE agents. All students deserve to study in an environment which is safe, secure, and free from fear. Adopting this resolution will send a strong message to our students and also to the community at large that we value them. We are invested in their success regardless of their immigration status. So we urge you to adopt the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Ethan Bertrand. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Board President Croninger, uh, Superintendent President BB, and members of the board. Uh, my name is Ethan Bertrand. I'm a proud alumnus of Santa Barbara City College. Really glad to be back here today. I'm also a newly elected director of the Isla Vista Community Services District. Um, a very, there I represent a very diverse community, an inclusive community, which uh, makes up many of your students as well as your constituents. The mission of Santa Barbara City College includes the provision of a diverse learning environment. In order to uphold this mission, I think it's incumbent on the board to protect this mission and to protect the diverse learning community that is here at Santa Barbara City College. When I moved here from New Jersey a few years ago and stepped on the campus of this school, I felt welcomed, I felt um, that it was an opening campus, and I felt that it was a place where people were accepted for who they are. Um, this fine institution prepared me, the son of a Latin American immigrant, um, a person of color, and a young and proud gay man, to excel in my academics, to become a lifelong learner, and to become a leader in my community. Um, it's truly, this is a special place that I felt welcomed and that's really empowered me, and I hope that this institution can continue to be a welcoming place for all students. Um, and I really think that a lot of our students, especially undocumented students, are at a big threat with this administration, um, and I think that the board can do really well by um, approving this resolution. I'd like to thank my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Jonathan Abood, for his leadership on this. Um, I think it's really great. Um, and then one suggestion that I do have, um, a possible amendment to this resolution. In the first whereas, I was very happy to see gender identity and expression um, listed. Um, one thing I didn't see was sexual orientation. So if that's something that would be considered by the board, I think that would be really good to add. Um, but thank you so much. OK, thank you, Ethan. Uh, Vivian Stanton. My name is Vivian Stanton. I'm a retired Santa Barbara Public Elementary School teacher, and I'm currently in my sixth year here at City College as an English and writing tutor in the EOPS department. Um, in my time here, I've gotten to know um, some undocumented students' personal background stories when they've come to me for assistance in writing a personal narrative for a class assignment. And as they tell their stories of immigration to the US, they often reveal shocking, dangerous, and heart-wrenching aspects of their journeys. This is always very moving for me because I would have never known what these beautiful individuals have had to go through had they not been given this specific assignment. 
the horrific circumstances some have had to endure, as well as their struggles to learn English and to adapt to a new culture and survive financially, do not show on their outsides. The fact that they are here at City College is a testimony to their courage and their desire to create a better life for themselves and their families. These people are my heroes. One young woman wrote about seeing dead bodies in the desert while coming into the US with her family. Today, she's in her second year of nursing school through City College and beginning her second clinical rotation at Cottage Hospital. She recently came back um, to see me for input regarding a financial aid application that she was filing, and she shared that her first clinical rotation had been a huge success. She received tremendous marks from the hospital staff and the Spanish-speaking patients at the hospital expressed such tremendous relief and gratitude for her care and ability to translate for them. She played a critical role in their understanding of medical procedures and instructions for home care and medications. This student went into nursing specifically to give back to her community and her services will benefit the broader population as a whole. This is just one example of a story of an undocumented student, but there are many more. Overall, the undocumented students that I have worked with have been the most grounded, hardworking, motivated, and worthy people you could ever hope to meet. They're their desire is to overcome their circumstances and better themselves through education and to give back. Like I said, they are my heroes. Currently, they're being frightened by the rhetoric coming out of Washington. For this reason, it is important that the Board of Trustees declare City College to be a sanctuary campus. Our community needs to know that City College values them and intends to not only stand with them, but to stand up for them. They deserve the reassurance and validation that such a declaration could help to provide. Please take the step to reach out to this valuable component of our student population and reaffirm City College's mission of inclusivity. Let them know that City College understands their fear and pledges to support them. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, Nancy Weiss. Good evening, President Beavy and uh, members of the Board of Trustees. It's good to see you, having worked alongside a number of you. Um, Nancy Weiss, I'm here on behalf of my family actually here today. We had this discussion last night and this morning about speaking out. As other speakers have said, probably far more eloquently than I can, this is a moment to speak out. And I really want to thank Trustee Abood for penning this resolution uh, that I really urge uh, your board to adopt. Um, You've heard many eloquent reasons why uh, you should go ahead and adopt this resolution. I would only add that I think it really validates the contributions that all students um, of lots of diverse backgrounds uh, contribute, and that's both academic and economic. We know many students not only contribute to uh, the vigor in the, the classrooms that are here, but are also working in the community, as are their families. Um, so it's a very complex, deep-rooted issue that, that our country is faced with as we look at uh, going forward. But um, that conversation on the political level really doesn't have a place when folks are seeking education, in my opinion. So uh, this resolution uh, is a wonderful start in speaking out and um, resisting the kind of hateful rhetoric that we're hearing um, out of DC. So thank you for your time and I, I really encourage you to support the resolution. Thank you, Nancy. So that concludes our um, speakers. And now in order to uh, move our process forward, let me have a motion and a second and then we'll have our discussion. So. Um,
unless somebody, did, Craig, were you indicating a question or were you just no, wanting to discuss? I would want to discuss, but I'd like to make a brief statement about um, what I've heard here tonight. Well, let's do it after we um, do the motion and okay. second, and then we'll go. We'll have our discussion. So, I know Jonathan motion <laughs> to approve. Oh, I motion to approve the resolution. <laughs> second. Peter second. Okay. Now, um, folks want to make comments or discussion. Craig. Yeah, now's probably an appropriate time for me to share this. And I listen to every one of you, and I've, like a lot of you that had personal stories, I have many I could share, and we would be here for the next two hours. Mm -hmm. um, I have a very good friend, a small businessman in uh, Mexico. Um, one day, he was, uh, just a few years ago, he was up visiting my house. Um, the only story I'm going to tell. Um, and my daughter was unemployed at the time, and we were sitting in the patio, probably drinking margaritas or cerveza. And um, my daughter was complaining about, oh, woe is me. I can't find a job and not feeling good about herself. And my friend, Raul, he said to her, and um, he says, how could you be so negative? You know, you live in a country with more opportunity than any other country in the world. Why do you think everybody wants to come here? Um, he says, if you don't have a future, you know, then what about all those other people in the world that don't have what you have? Because nobody has it any better. And that's a lead into these thoughts that I wanted to share with you. Because I see a reaction and a kind of a fear, and I've heard numerous of you speakers talk about um, being afraid and this atmosphere that's growing. And I thought, this is, this is my reaction to it, and I got this when I was a senior in college, right before I graduated in a seminar class. And it boils down to this, to have a little faith. We have a system of government in this country. It ebbs and flows. It goes one direction for a while, goes another direction for a while, but no one division of our government runs the whole government. Um, people are, have the freedom of speech. They could speak out with pretty much without fear. They can participate. We have seen people come and go in this country. I have in my short life, maybe longer than others even. But um, I've seen people, when I was young, I saw, I heard Dart Martin Luther King speak um, before his famous speech. I had, a, I had a high school history teacher that quit teaching while I was in high school at San Marcos High School, which was a brand new high school at the time. And he went off in the Deep South um, registering blacks to vote. Um, don't be afraid. You hear rhetoric, you hear, you hear speech. This country fosters free speech. Um, in some countries of the world, there is no free speech. That's why people come here, for freedom and opportunity. It's a process. It's not always going to be, it's hard to change things because it's basic human nature. Everybody more or less fears change. Don't be afraid. Just, it won't get you anywhere. Work hard, stay focused on what you're here to do and what you're trying to do. One man speaking out, even if he is the president of this country, is not the whole government, and the process takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Our country is not a dictatorship. It's a participative form of governments. And um, have a little faith in those people that are elected. Some of them are very political, maybe not too trustworthy, but by and large, this country's done pretty good with our system of government. So my word is, have a little faith, just a little bit, and worry about what you're doing, and concentrate on your studies. Um, I saw friends of mine back in the 60s get all riled up and demonstrating about Vietnam and everything. Didn't do a whole lot of good, but finally the war did end. This is a crisis, but we shall weather it, and we will do our best to weather it together. So my prayers are with you. Just have a little faith. Okay. That's it. I'm done. That's the most or, <laughs> or a longest oration I've done in a long time. Thank you. Okay, Craig is done. Marty's turn. You're gonna have to hand out a box of Kleenex with that if you keep going. Oh, I want a so violin and a towel. <laughs> <laughs> and a bucket. Uh, no, I know Raúl and you and I went down to Mexico yes. together to this one-room schoolhouse that had yes. dirt on the floor and. 
honestly, they, they jammed, what, about 50, six-year-olds in there? Yeah. You know, you and I worry Might about 15, you know, first graders. Yes. I, you know, what do you do with them on a rainy day? Well, these kids were in there. There was no bathroom. The whole thing was just right. dirt. And it, uh, it struck me as uh, anybody that's wondering why people are bringing their children across, you know, illegally, um, all they have to do is go there for five minutes and see it, or less. You know, um, when we, when we oh, saw that, sorry. That sister city organization with Santa Barbara was, and maybe still is, the largest single sister city organization out of the United States, and it's That's between, right. and most active, between Santa Barbara and Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And I certainly hope it's still there doing well, because it's needed, and also we need to know on this side what things are like and, and what they do well, and they do some things very well. Yes, they do. They made some nice hat for me. It was <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, but that's, I know they do a lot more. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I'm so proud to live in California, which has, you know, to see our leaders up there speaking and to see this, the letters that came from the community college um, heads and, and from the, um, uh, CSUs and, and UCs, I was just blown away because it wasn't something that I expected. I thought, oh no, we're going to have another fight. It's going to be another Iraqi war. I'm going to have to ho hold a bull bullhorn in my hands on State Street, which is not something I love doing. Uh, but, but the truth is, we're all in this together. And when we look at the systems in California, it's just truly amazing. And then to hear, oh, I'm going to have to swear a little bit, one, one little swear word. To hear Jerry Brown say, we're going to put up our own damn satellite, I thought, yes, we can do that if we have to. <laughs> so we are all in this together, and I really think um, if you want to look at YouTube and see Hannah Beth Jackson speaking, um, it, it was just amazing. I watched it twice, which is not something I usually do to political speeches, but it was just totally wonderful. So all of our staff, everybody here at City College uh, knows by now the mission <laughs> because we put it on every wall, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And the mission starts out by saying, as a public community college, SBCC is dedicated to the success of each student. It doesn't say we're only dedicated to the success of students that were born in the United States. It says to each student. And uh, each foreign student, each person that, that is a California, you know, a graduate of one of our schools, um, all those things, and we're, we're going to give you free tuition and, and, and fees and free um, books thanks to the uh, College Promise, but we also really truly feel, and I have to say this, if you don't feel like this and you work for the college, let me know, but I haven't heard anybody who works for this college, either on the staff or as a faculty member, who doesn't feel, every single person feels that um, each student is precious and they work with the students, and honestly, I've never seen such a caring group of people. It's just totally amazing. So um, from my point of view, we don't have time for anything else except to try to get all of our students, you know, faster graduation rates and all those transfer rates. We want everything to be, you know, we want them to be so successful. Why would we spend some time you know, trying to fight them. That's not what we should be doing. We should be helping them out. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I had an older brother who, who marched with uh, Dr. King, and I, it really touched me because uh, he passed away a couple years ago, but he would be so proud of this right now. So thank you all, and thanks to Jonathan for putting this together. Um, we just, um, I don't think we need a, a, a label on us because we are caring people. We're good people here. And even the sport is doing okay. So thanks, thanks, Jonathan, for putting this together. Even? Even, even the sport, yeah, even Jonathan. <laughs> I thought that too, Peter. Yeah. No, even the board, I have to say that, because sometimes um, you get some funny boards. We don't do that. <laughs> okay, uh, Marianne and then Emily. I was listening to, whoops, this whole discussion and thinking, um, anybody who has met me knows I've been around a long time. And I've been around in times when people were silent and times when they were not silent. And I must say to all of you that spoke today, thank you 
The difference is very, very important to our country. We have to have people who speak out. Even if I disagree with what is said, the idea of speaking out, whether you are afraid or not afraid, building on Craig's statement, or whether you speak something that I agree with or don't agree with, thank you so much for coming and for speaking out. And I hope you will continue to do so. Thank you. Okay. Emily? I uh, want to thank Jonathan again for bringing this forth. I think this is incredible. Um, it really shows the students that we stand behind you, uh, no matter what your immigration status may be. Uh, on top of that, I would just like to take Ethan's uh, comment into consideration and possibly add uh, sexual orientation into it, if that's possible. Um, on top of that, I think we have to keep in mind that love does trump hate, and we will continue to push forward with that motto. Okay, so Jonathan, you're accepting the, and um, let's see, you made the motion. Peter, you're okay too with the sexual orientation um, with that amendment. Anyone else with comments? Because we can go to a vote. Veronica, are you? Go, Peter. And Peter? No. I, I have to speak as an immigrant, uh, and it's a lot easier being fearless if you're not an immigrant. I, uh, I want to speak in favor of, of the resolution, as I think we all do. But I also want to point out that this is not a departure from existing policy. This has been our consistent policy. This is a way and I, I support us doing this. It's a way of saying, yes, we, we really mean it. It isn't, it isn't just a slight thing for us. It's very real. We're here for the purpose of educating the next generation. It doesn't matter where you're from. If you're an immigrant, you're an immigrant, and you're welcome. And we hope that you will you'll benefit from this experience. Um, Ethan said that, um, that he had experienced this as a welcoming community and hoped that we would continue to be welcoming. Um, it's, it's certainly, I think there is consensus on this, on this dais that that's our intent. Because this, uh, the, the, the burden on the student for studying is, is hard enough without having to wonder if somebody's looking for something that will mean his imminent departure. Um, like, uh, like Fernando, I also uh, came here as a child. I also went to Los Angeles City College. I also went to Cal State LA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the benefits that were given to me speak to me every day. And my, my capacity to, to want to give back to this community that has been so good to me is a, a benefit that's often overlooked. So I support the resolution, but I'd like us to go one step further. Because this resolution, in a, in a separate way, is really not necessary. It shouldn't be necessary. Had the Congress done its job and provided us with meaningful compromises and working together to come up with a revised process by which people could come to this country and stay in this country, uh, we, we wouldn't be having this discussion. So I would urge us to renew our commitment to find members of Congress who would behave like adults and uh, get the job done. Thank you, Peter. Anyone? Veronica? Yeah, so I just want, I mean, I want to thank our community members and everybody that reached out to us, but I think echoing our colleagues here on the board, this resolution just reaffirms policies that are already in place that what I don't want is I wouldn't want, so we're taking this action as a board to say that we're making Santa Barbara City College safe. 
No, in my viewpoint, Santa Barbara City College has always been safe. And unless we, at least at the board level, and we don't get in the weeds, so I don't know, I'm not on the ground. I know that we, our campus is safe for students and for faculty, for employees, for staff, and for visitors. And especially having someone at the caliber of Pat English at the helm of our human resources. <laughs> this institution holds that type of accountability and character for everyone that comes here. So for me, this isn't a, a vote against a political administration or a country. So I do differ, and I part from you, Jonathan, on that. I look at this and I say, we have policies that are in place, we have administrative regulations and procedures that basically outline how this institution is to run based on the policies that we set. When I look at this, I agree with Peter. I think of the policies we have to support all of our students. Um, we cannot be a sanctuary campus uh, we, everything here is in accordance to whatever is allowed to us by law. Um, we have had AB 540 students because that is what California allows for us. And so we are here as a nonpartisan. I mean, yes, we all have political parties that we affiliate with. Obviously, a, a wonderful mayor, you know, served. And, and it is political for some of us. But we serve the whole city. We serve the whole college. And I think you said it very eloquently, Marcia. We do, we have people in our very own campus that think different. And it's a, it, that academic discourse. We have policies on academic discourse and freedom. Um, I thank Craig for reminding us to have faith in wherever you find faith. Um, I don't know what brings people safety. I have the need to feel safe. My husband's always telling me, it's fine. I'm like, you lock the doors? You know, I'm mother. I have a need to feel safe. I count my students 20 times a day. Who came in from lunch? Who came out? I have the need to make sure that Roosevelt is safe, that my classroom is safe. As human beings, we want that. I don't know that this resolution is going to make all of our students safe. But I do trust that Dr. Beebe, that our vice president, that all our staff is doing everything that they know to do to ensure that when students, visitors, anybody steps foot on this campus, they feel like they're welcome and that they're safe and that they're here to accomplish their goals, their career paths, everything that fulfills that mission. Um, so I, I'm in favor for this because it supports our policies, but just for that, because I'm not supporting it thinking that we weren't safe yesterday. I have no evidence to that. And should Dr. Beebe bring that to the board, then that would be a different conversation. But unless the board disagrees, to our knowledge, we have departments and faculty and staff that are committed to all of our students. Okay, I think we are ready to vote. Um, this is a resolution, so Angie needs to ask us. Trustee Nielsen. Aye. Trustee Haslin? Allowed, aye. <laughs> Trustee Abood? Aye. Trustee Croninger? Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Gallardo? Aye. Trustee Kugler? Aye. Student Trustee Gribble? Aye. Okay, the resolution passes. I think that's, that's pretty close to unanimous. <laughs> And uh, thank you to all of you who came and commented in person, wrote some emails, wrote some letters, and I encourage people to keep that up. We like you to pay attention to our issues and give us your thoughts on other topics as well. Um, Good comment. <laughs> Sometimes this hall is empty. <laughs> you know, yes. Don't be afraid. Um, we now move to developing the consent agenda. I'll give a moment for people to get out of here and um, those who want to leave. This would have been a good day for cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> right? No. <laughs> yeah. oh. yeah. Emily? I pointed at you because you were smiling so much. I just thought, no, it's just like, well, <laughs> we were all so serious, and I looked over at you, a huge smile. It was good. That's the way I thought we were, yeah. Unanimous. <laughs>
Okay, um, on the consent agenda, um, we are covering items 9.1 through, through 9.4. Greg, <laughs> we're back. Okay, uh, items 9.1 through 9.4. Uh, I would like to pull 10.1 briefly, and 10.2, 11.1 through 11.3. Anthony has a brief correction on one item. Yeah, it has to do with the uh, professional experts for credit and it's the human resources actions involving experts and volunteers. We put down for uh, Sharif um, Taha um, that her, her rate and, and amount is coming out of the general fund. It's not, it's actually coming out of an auxiliary fund. So it's auxiliary fund in, instead of the general fund. It's just a, uh, an edit that we caught. Okay. Um, so does anyone want to pull any other items? I was briefly pulling, as I said, 10.1, uh, just for a quick comment. All right, um, so that means we need a motion to approve 9.1 through 9.4, 10.2, and 11.1 through 11.3. Can I have a motion? Mary Ann? I so move. Second? Craig seconds, okay. Any comments? All in favor, oh. No, I just said, I, I know, um, I just wanna say thank you, Lynn, or whoever put that note for the West Campus that we still have, you know, yes, we're changing order, but we still have a certain dollar amount and that's mm -hmm. still within the budget and it's 60 X percent complete. And so just to publicly say good job to our people that are watching That's it. Lindsay. Yes, I know, that's yeah. what I wanna say to her, thank you, because, um, because that's important, and so it takes a lot of diligence. Yes, um, I actually thank you for reminding me, Veronica, because I have a note right here to say it's a really good explanation, Lindsay, and thank you, because I don't feel any need to ask any questions. Yeah. I see what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's unusual. I, I'd I know it's unusual, <laughs> especially fiscal. No, I, I'd send a note saying something about the clarity of item 11.1. Uh, mm -hmm. It was confusing to me, and if it was, it might be confusing to others. You want to pull it and ask? Well, it, if it can be cleared up instantly, then and I suspect it will. Okay. Yeah, well, we can. What was your confusion? The confusion is the wording of, of spending $8.6 million to the county treasurer. I'm quite sure that there's a reason for that. We have Lindsay right here, actually. and she's ready. You don't want to give the county treasurer eight million dollars from us? <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, good, it's it a good question. It occurred to me that I had better ideas than to give it to the county treasurer. Hello. I can tell you for the next board meeting, all of those are going to be rewritten as well, so okay. you can understand what they mean going forward. Okay. I'm, I'm Just enjoying so you, rewriting you understand them. understand why it was confusing to me. Sure, absolutely. A lot of these things that we put forward to the board are just done per ed code, and they can be confusing to a you know outsider. What that that item is is it's showing you oh, this is sinking um, the list of all of the things we've paid in that entire month, every single financial disbursement we made. So payroll is a huge chunk of that, and our main bank is with the county. So that's what it's saying is that with our main bank account through the county, we've expended all of these funds. In the past, you may recall, we used to actually attach the check register was many, many, many pages long. We stopped doing that a while ago because it was just extra, extraneous information. So that's all it is. It's just us dispersing checks for all of our various payments that have already been approved through uh, those various processes. My recommendation would be a very simple statement to that effect. Yep. Because in a sense, we are all I mean, we'll be insiders within a meeting or two, but all of the folks who just left, they, they might just also trip over this agenda mm -hmm. and want to know, what the hell are they spending eight and a half million dollars for? Absolutely. Point well taken, <laughs> Trustee Aslan. We'll, we'll work, continue to work on this. Communications. Okay. And congratulations on the West Campus explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, we have a motion and a second. Let's go for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
All of those pass. 10.1 is our sabbatical leaves for 2017-18. Um, and I guess the reason that I pulled it is I just want to make a comment, um, and others may want to make comments too. Sabbatical leaves are a wonderful way in which our faculty can uh, raise the level of our education for our students by, as Michael demonstrated, um, develop classes, research, um, issues that will enable them to come back and share with their colleagues a new or better way to approach their job and, um, and ours uh, for student success. At the same time, they are folks who are away from campus and are not providing income uh, for us, and we are in a budget crunch. In the past, there has been some give and take on sabbaticals as part of trying to deal with a budget crunch. And so I'm just, you know, kind of looking ahead at what we will be talking about more in the future and saying there's a finite pool of money here and we're all in it together to figure out where that money goes. So we're making choices we can't have and, and, it's and, or these days. And I just wanted to reinforce that. Craig. My initial reaction when I, when I read this, you know, and I, I really like the faculty being able to do that, and I thought two things. Um, I thought, man, in, in private business, it's the people that want to get ahead. They sort of do things like this as an extracurricular activity and then come back, and I, then I thought, but this is a different world and it's not a business. So um, I'm thinking, okay, they, there's another facet that they bring back that doesn't happen necessarily in private enterprise. It's, it's this uh, caring about the institution, about the student welfare, because that's why you're here. You're not here to make money, you're here for the students. And I've seen this example over and over again at this particular college versus others, um, the fantastic results that we seem to be getting in certain areas. Um, and then, it, and so th that's how I was thinking and then I was thinking, if you hadn't have pulled this, I would have asked you to ask to it to be pulled, because I have some questions about why. There's more than I've seen before on the same list, and I couldn't say which one to not do or how to not do it, but we have budget. We have budgetary considerations. Is this super, a super expensive thing for us? No, but a whole bunch of these kind of things happening can add up. So I... I was wondering, do we have any like caps on place, like how many we should offer per year, or what's going on, and how come so many this time? And I couldn't cut one of them over another one. I, I just saw all kind of equal benefit. Sabbaticals are a bargained uh, component. They, um, they're in our, our faculty agreement. The faculty association um, negotiates these and these have been in, uh, committed to for, you know, a, a couple of years now. So we're we're talking about four full year uh, sabbaticals for the faculty that have been agreed to and bargained in good faith. And um, what you're seeing here is some people aren't taking the full year. Some people are taking, as Michael did, just a semester. And so you can kind of mix and match the the number of. Of sabbaticals, so there's there's more than four because some folks are taking just one semester as opposed to a full year. Okay. Um, yes, you know, next year we're we're going to be up against a significant budget crunch with uh, you know our nine million dollar deficit that that we're working on on solving, and and we've got a, we're getting a better handle on that every day. We we talk about it to some extent, um, but this is something that that we're going to be talking with uh, the faculty association. Uh, to figure out how they might be able to contribute to the solution of this. I do want to say uh, one thing, though, in defense of, of these sabbaticals. You, you saw Michael's presentation where he developed an online class for the film studies program. That is going to leverage, ultimately, um, resources. Re the resource in this particular case is Michael and his, and his skill set to be able to address uh, a broader uh, number of students potentially, 
um, in the online environment and help leverage his, his resources um, that would be strictly in the in the face-to-face -face environment. So in some ways we're looking at an investment uh, for the future when we talk about these professional development activities when we, when we talk about sabbaticals. So you know it is a it's a balancing act and I hear that and and we all hear that we know that but um, it is an investment in the future. Okay, does that answer your or Craig? Almost I, I don't um, I know that Probably three years after I was first sworn in, I think this is my fifth year. Why am I doing this? <laughs> and um, you, we um, we found out that prior to my coming onto the board, that sabbaticals had been like suspended, and we were asked to redo. And so we voted to reinstitute it or to to put it back into effect. And um, now we're faced with a with a budget crisis that very much rivals what we went through what the college went through before, and yet we're still doing this. Sometimes I see the benefit in things that you, you're, you have to do it or you're not gonna get what you need for the future. Um, I see the benefit in these sabbaticals and what they bring to us. We have all these outstanding departments and, and if we don't do that, we're not gonna, we can't expect to get those results. There you go. I think, I hope that the faculty, when they take these at a time of, you know, tight purse strings, that uh, they fully realize that we desperately need the positive results from what they do. Um, and I'm not saying that's not their intention, but I mean it's really necessary. It's not just free time out there. Um, I, um, I'll leave it to uh, the president's, to Dr. Beebe's um, recommendation to us but I'm very concerned as mm -hmm. well. Thank you for responding that. in some detail. You bet. Veronica. Yeah, maybe one thing, that could be, it's maybe one day we can, <coughs> not now, obviously, whenever, soon in the near future, um, learn the criteria for, you know, awarding them. And only because, and I'm not gonna put a, a stamp of a great, like I wouldn't, I'm not gonna judge what that one is better than another, but I do know that some stick out of like, oh my gosh, you did that in your sabbatical. And I think of the nursing, what was your friend? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I forget her name, but oh my gosh, she like did this Literally. amazing yeah. thing with Cottage. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh my gosh, you did that. And not to say that somebody who maybe came with um, a you know, narrative that was any less, I, I don't say that, but so I think if we learned maybe the criteria or how these things, then maybe it'll help you understand how yeah. it gets prioritized. Um, obviously, when it comes to us, it's just approve it on a funding end of it. But there is a process that's in place and learning that. And, and I know there's a whole committee that has yes. been talking in the last couple of years about how do they really raise the caliber of what the output and the final product is. And I'd be glad to provide that to the board at, at a later date. It's quite extensive. As you can imagine, these are prized, um, prized uh, processes and prized uh, sabbaticals when you get them. So it is quite a process. And I'll share that with you in the future. Peter. Peter. As, as someone who has taken a sabbatical, I, I can assure you that, uh, and I'm not sure that I can really assure you, I, but I want to tell you that from my perspective, <laughs> it was extraordinarily valuable. Uh, and and th there's a, it, it's, it's a, it's a form of professional development that has no equal. Mm -hmm. And faculty will be attracted to apply for jobs at Santa Barbara City College because we have sabbaticals. And they will, they will very likely be deterred from applying for a position on this campus. Um, and and we're, we're, if, if we don't have them, mm -hmm. we're trying to attract the very finest. And, and that's what they expect. Um, I, I think the, the process, and I think this is an important point that you, you ask about, the process by which a sabbatical leave is recommended uh, involves a, a careful vetting by a sabbatical leave committee composed of faculty. And, and that, that faculty can be really tough on, on the sabbatical applicant. And I think, I think that's essential. It's essential for us to know that in order for us to have confidence that the vetting process is serious and that they come up with, as you pointed out, the, the very best proposals so that the outcome is truly of benefit to the college. If you want to see 
what has been accomplished as a consequence of this in the past, the library has full collection of all sabbatical leave reports that uh, are available to you to have a look at. And they're very, they're very serious. And was it, is it yours one of the briefest? <laughs> no. Oh, it wasn't. I knew it was one way or the other. I, 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 can, I can assure you, mine was not brief. <laughs> no, okay. Marianne. And as you would expect, I'm totally in favor of sabbaticals. <clears throat> I have never seen a sabbatical that did not uh, improve either the instructional approach or the academic knowledge of the person who took it. And I've seen a lot of them. Um, and I have been asked one question I want to answer, not that any of you have asked it, but I do get it a lot, and so I'm going to answer it. People say, well, why don't faculty do their studying in the evening? Why do they have to have a semester off or whatever? And I have two answers for that. They don't do it in the evening because in the evening they're grading papers. And they don't do it in the evening because when they go on sabbatical, they go to study under um, significant academic leaders in their area of expertise, people that they would never have an opportunity to study under, under other circumstances. Well, I think we've got my, oh, oh, just Marty. my little half of yes. um, I think in the future we're probably going to have to limit them. I mean, it just looks like we might. That might be a, something that we want to consider when we're doing the collective bargaining. But um, I think if we did that, um, I think we should be careful because I really think that we should be reviewing that decision every however long that collective bargaining agreement is, or putting a review in it. Because when we first came on board, I had no idea that they weren't doing sabbaticals. And it was kind of a surprise to me. And I think everyone on, the, on, on our board at that time you know, might have been surprised by that. So um, I'm just saying, I think it's, I think reducing the number is easier than just knocking them all out and forgetting about them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is it is our agreement with the faculty association at this point to do this many sabbaticals, and clearly we have um, ample support for that whole concept, regardless of that. My, my point was mostly about the budget choices we will have to make and engaging our faculty in in those, those choices. choices. So, so um, down, down the road, we'll we will see. see. But good, but good comments, comments, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, so, um, so, so, all in favor, all in favor. Right. Um, we had a, we motion, had a motion, right? Did, right? Did I forget, I forget the motion? Yeah, 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 you forgot the motion. Uh, uh, I, I, would I would move, move to, to approve the resolution. The resolution. Okay. Second, second. Craig, Craig. All in all favor. favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. Opposed. Thank you. Thank you, Angie, for, for keeping, keeping track, track, track of that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was just an item. It's an item. It's an item, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, now we, now we have a resolution, now, however, which, which is the implementation of revenue. Of revenue. Um, um, can we do, can that, do that together with budget transfer? Budget transfer? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Take those, those together. Okay, okay. Um, so, um, I need so I need a motion to approve 12.1, uh, augmentation of revenue, revenue and, and budget, budget transfer 12.2, transfer of major, major objects. objects. Mm -hmm. Jonathan. Jonathan. Who's approved approval? Yes, I'm yes, I'm yes. Marty, Marty, Marty are you seconding? seconding? Okay, okay. Okay, Angie? Trustee Nielsen? Aye. Trustee Hasland? Aye. Trustee Abood? Aye. Trustee Croninger? Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Gallardo? Aye. Trustee Kugler? Aye. Student Trustee Gribble? Okay. <coughs> One thing left. Um, item 12.3, <coughs> resolution number 20, the non-resident tuition fee uh, for all of our non-residents. Anthony. Yeah, one of the speakers mentioned that sometimes we have to make difficult financial decisions for the, for the betterment of the whole. And in some ways, the non-resident fee is kind of one of those situations. 
Every year the Ed Code requires of us to establish a non-resident fee um, for the district and it has to be established no later than February 1st. So we are right up against the deadline with this, with this item. Um, the state provides, when it comes to non-resident fees, the state provides seven different options for determining uh, the charge of non-resident fees. And except for option seven, and I'm, I'm not gonna get into the weeds of all the, how you calculate um, each one of those options, although I can, I can assure you that I have calculated personally each one of the options, um, as Lindsay knows, um, myself, um, just so I completely understand what it is that I'm asking of you. Option seven is the only option of the of the of the seven that um, is not cost based. In other words, the other six are all about just just breaking even, just recovering our costs. And many times those costs are not full costs; are not fully Im embedded um, in the particular option. Option seven gives us a little flexibility because it's based on setting the fee relative to the average tuition of 12 states that are similar um, indexed um, to California. And uh, so what, what the administration here is recommending to you, what I'm recommending to you is that we use option seven to give, us, give ourselves a little more flexibility uh, to be able to modify the fee above what it, it's been for the last few years. We haven't adjusted the fee. It's been $235, $235 for the last few years, and so we haven't adjusted that, even though our costs have gone up. Um, so, you know, uh, Executive Vice President Jarrell, um, Lindsay, and I um, did quite a study of the past fees, and we were looking at um, the effect of some of the fee changes that have taken place over the past, I think we went back 10 years um, looking at the fees, and we noticed that within a band, within a band of uh, fee price increases, that there is something called um, inelasticity, meaning that you can move the, the price without negatively impacting the number of students that we have. So that, that's an economic theory um, looked at in isolation. Now, of course, we have other factors. We have a new administration in Washington, D.C., and we have other things that are going on. Um, but within this particular band, and we're, we're looking to increase the, the non-resident fee by $23, um, which is within that band um, per, per unit per semester, um, which would increase it from <coughs> our, our non-resident fee from 235 to $258 um, for 2017-18, which would take effect in uh, the fall semester. And so um, that's the fee base, or the fee piece. There's another component to this, which is called the capital outlay recovery fee, which has to do with the impact that um, non-resident students have on our facilities. And we've, we've been charging $26 uh, per semester unit, and we're recommending to increase that by $1 to $27 per semester unit. Um, all of this combined then um, works out to a total of uh, $285 for a semester unit for non-resident uh, uh, students, uh, again, to take effect in the fall of next year. Okay, so can I have a motion to um, approve the resolution for the non-resident tuition fee, and then we can have discussion? So move. Marty moves, Craig seconds. Um, I just wanna mention, I did the same kind of analysis that Anthony did, though not nearly as sophisticated as I'm sure, but I remembered that we had bumped the fees. Um, what at that time was calculated to be almost 19 percent um, a couple of years ago, and um, this is less than half that, and or yeah, less than half that. 
And we lost a few students, but our income was substantially greater. And we didn't lose all that many that you would say this is a factor. So to me, it looked pretty inelastic. And then when Anthony came up with the comparison fees from the other colleges that have significant number of students, um, that was very interesting to me because I'd not seen that before. We previously were comparing ourselves under the category, I think it's five, four, four, four. number four, where you look to your contiguous colleges, which is Ventura and Allen Hancock, who have almost no very few uh, students in these categories. So it didn't make sense. What makes sense is to look at, at um, other colleges with similar groups of students. So I was convinced in my looking at it that it, it is inelastic at this level at least, um, that this is not the thing that's going to make a difference to somebody. What's going to make a difference is other things that are happening in a broader scheme. Can I also, I just wanted to add, it, the, the other thing is the housing costs here. That's so when a parent them. gets the you know, their son or daughter gets to go, then they have to start looking at the costs, and it's tremendous, so. Or even availability. Can right, you availability it? too, yeah. But you see Santa Monica City College, and that's probably why that's so high in some ways. So um, maybe that kind of goes in with our student housing a little bit too. It may. It's almost a housing. But I think there's thing, a lot of things you could. I don't want to get could, that mixed in, but I, yeah. But I think there's a lot of things you could speculate could affect issue. what happens next yeah. year, and I, my biggest worry is that we're taking something of a shot in the dark when we do the budget um, because of the things that we're not controlling at the national level. Um, we may or may not get uh, people moving around yeah, I don't know. <laughs> nationally and internationally. <laughs> so, Emily. So uh, coming from out of state and out of area, uh, tuition costs have always been uh, personal concern of mine, um, as well as many of my uh, colleagues here. And I'm not too sure, uh, budget-wise, you know, the ins and outs, so I'm sure there's um, vast reasoning behind this increase. But, uh, you know, doing a little bit of research myself with some students going over this uh, increase, we were looking, you know, the first eight years of um, decades of 2000 to 2008, we went from 145 to $179, and that's a 4.25% increase. If you look at 2010 to 2018, it's a 10% increase. So that's just the precedent I think we're setting that um, we can just increase the costs of out-of-state students and I don't think we're really looking too carefully into what effect that $20 increase actually has on students. It's not just a minor, you know, mom and dad can write the credit card bill off and it's perfectly fine. It's, it's, it's not those, that situation for many of our out-of-state students. We come here to receive um, education from such a prestigious institution. And the outreach to out-of-state area students has, we have made conscious efforts to decrease our outreach to out of area, out of state students, and now we're increasing their tuition costs. So how does that weigh out? Is it as elastic as we hope it is? Or in reality, has our efforts to decrease enrollment for out of area students, and then we're gonna be increasing their tuition as well? How much of a deterrence would that be? Now I'm leaving after this semester, but this is a difference between taking three classes and taking four classes. This is the difference between being full-time enrolled and part, excuse me, part-time enrolled. These dollars matter. These dollars really matter in the eyes of a student. And um, on behalf of who I've talked to and the students I've engaged with, to kind of feel, you know, and, and not just represent a personal opinion, I've talked to um, a handful of out-of-state students and they are not in support of this. Um, and, and, and so I have to say that I am not as well. I appreciate how it may feel more personal for you because these are the tuition numbers you look at. Well, though like, you are leaving, so I'm leaving, not so personally. it's not so personal yeah. anymore. It's yeah. more of the fact that um, it is the difference between being a full-time enrolled student and then taking on a second job. So I, there are real life 
considerations, especially when you're out of area and then have to be factoring in rent on top of that and finding a place to live where our local students are now promised the thank gosh the local you know the promise act as well as housing situations with family relatives and whatnot so if we keep putting this pressure on the back of our out-of-state students we're going to lose them well um, I think what we're looking at and correct me if I'm wrong Anthony but we're looking at it in a financial mode and um, in a particular this inelasticity concept is also supported by the fact that in, I didn't bring the numbers with me, you were doing your research, I should have. Um, in 910 was our peak enrollment right. at the college, as I think we all have become familiar with. And yet, if you look at our enrollment from non-resident students, you know, all of the non-resident students who are the ones that have these um, fees attached to them. We increased, um, do we have the number attached here? I think we might have uh, the history on it, but it was a very substantial increase from 910, um, do you have the number here? To, uh, I'm just thinking of the fee that we charged in 910. Maybe you have it, Emily. From, nine, from 910 to 1011? No, just 910, the fee. The fee was increased from a 181 from 2008 2009 to 2009 2010 from 181 to 190. Okay, it's 190 and That's nine dollars. 190 and 910. What I'm getting at is, it was 190 and 910, and last year it was um, 235. 235, right? And we had an increase in our non-resident students over that time period. That was. Um, about a third mm -hmm. overall. So that tells me about inelasticity. It tells me that when you increase from the 190 number to the 235 number, you're, not see you're seeing an increase. You are seeing more students come in a very substantial way. During that time, were we or were we not doing more outreach to out-of-state, out-of-area students as well? That's my interpretation that that outreach has since been... No, it's been, I think, as far as I decreased. know, it's been growing. It grew during the period when we stopped the outreach that you're talking about. It continues to grow. So I'm not trying to get into that mix issue. What I'm trying to do is just say that I think it supports the inelasticity. That's where I'm talking about. Craig. I was under the, well, I believe that um, the outreach that had taken place prior to us stopping it, has a, that kind of outreach has a residual effect and it will carry on for so many years and then it will taper off. Now we are looking at those years when it's going to taper off, and I hope that when Dr. Beebe, when when you had that, your discussion with your with your VPs, that um, that you thought about that that we're not doing we're not recruiting. I mean, we're not putting ourselves out there. We're not advertising, so to speak. Or we're not publishing things, um, and um, you know those factors. You know. I'm, I would think that you would have looked at those as well, because mm -hmm. I think I think that alone, that one factor alone would account for, regardless of price, and mm -hmm. I would agree that the price is is uh, inelastic, inelastic. If our goal was to be a nonprofit institution that marketed our services to out of area students, then we'd be looking at a whole different thing. But our goal is a little different than that. Um, it doesn't necessarily exclude that, but, it, but that's not our, our goal. Our goal's uh, looked at differently. Um, it's unfortunate to have to raise the price of anything, but we do have to exist for the good of, our, of the whole of our student body. And we do have a substantial budget, ongoing budget deficit that we are struggling with yes. <laughs> in many directions. And we haven't increased the price of this for a few years now, so um, you know, and our costs have continued to go up. Oh no, but but if you listen to the to um, what the national economics people say is that you know there is no inflation, so um, why should we have to raise? 
funny how the budget doesn't look like that. <laughs> Jonathan. Um, so I have two ideas or questions if we can explore that can maybe mitigate this in the future. So the first, this was an idea that was talked a lot about at UC for that tuition. I didn't agree for it with the, in that regard, but can we do it so that you can lock in someone's tuition from when they like first start here, whatever they were paying, they're out of state? Because, you know, let's say they were here for one year, then the tuition goes up, and then that like disrupts their plans. Not exactly maybe for this one. And then they can just continue the second year without the change in finances. Maybe for that's grandfathered one idea. somehow. Yeah. We'd have to take a look at the uh, the ed code on that. I'm yeah. not sure that it would permit that. Yeah, my sense of it is that the way they write the memo on your your choices, they're not giving you that choice. But okay. it's worth yeah. checking. I mean, it's a creative idea. And then the other one is, you know, when we increase the cost, it does make the out-of-state population maybe less diverse. So could we make the foundation look into like a small amount of scholarships that would help rel not relieve the whole cost, but relieve some of the cost? to ensure that we're bringing in out-of-state students, not just like the rich kids, like to be frank about it, like people who are out-of-state who can, you know, provide to our diversity more. So noted on that, Jonathan. I'll yeah. be glad to talk to, to the foundation yeah, I mean, about that. That's, just, a, I, that's, that's indeed an interesting point. Yeah, it is. And that, I mean, while I take that and I, and I take to, you know, that when we give a direction to the president to give task off. So I don't agree with that. And so I wouldn't ask you to do that. So you're getting that from six out of seven, just so you know, because that's, I wouldn't task you with that, knowing that that's not in the mission of the foundation's focus right now. <coughs> that's not in the donors at this point in time. Not to say that scope is not important, but I wouldn't add that to the scope of the work right now. Just throwing out um, an idea. I, <laughs> let, me make, let me make a suggestion here. I think, um, we're going to have a robust discussion in the retreat about students, the mix of students, the pluses, the minuses, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so we're going to have a chance to really air this one. Uh, and Jonathan's idea can come up again, and, uh, and Veronica's comment about it is important too. But um, I'm suggesting we maybe try to separate out what, what here is kind of a required decision that we have to make on the money. <laughs> I, I like that idea. I would like maybe Dr. Beebe could take this in, in mind, could get a little prepared if there's any way to be prepared. Um, what we offer financial counseling to our students, um, financial aid counseling, guidance, whatever. You know, we have, the, we have these international students and out-of-state students. If, you know, I, I had one, uh, one young man from Kenya here for two years studying business. He needed one more semester. Okay, his family said, no, that's it, you're done. We can't afford it, it's not in the budget. Mm -hmm. And um, he didn't get to finish. And I felt really bad about that. I wanted to go, you know, pass the hat, kind of, and to see what I could do. And I thought, well, how many other people are there out there like that? Mm -hmm. You know, and what could we do? Because there's some kind of counseling we could provide on that, or are there resources? And there may not be. But I'll drop that in the pot, in the hat there, so when we, we get to the retreat, we could yeah. you know, discuss this I, I if there's any information. That's a good, good thing for the retreat as well. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of things to, to facets to these discussions, and we'll have hopefully time to do it. They're tough decisions. These, yeah. This is this just, just the beginning. Emily. To touch on uh, Jonathan's idea of kind of grandfathering uh, tuition, I think that that's a happy medium, um, but maybe we can, and if that's not a part of ed code possibly, maybe um, just kind of stating that this price will be the price for the next, uh, for 2017, 2018, and then maybe 2018, 2019, would it be? Yeah, so 2018, 2019, and having it just for our two year retention kind of hold that um, for two years, and, and, and then possibly revisit an increase or decrease um, in two years. That's a viable option. Well, I mean, I'm thinking that I mean, that's something that we might be able to consider. Yeah. But that's, you know, well, down the road. Yeah, I mean, it, it, given where we are with the budget, we're going to have to have a comprehensive plan mm. in mind for bridging this $9 million. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, so I can see it as a piece of the puzzle, but I think we also would have to check the ed code again. Yeah, because I'm just they saying may not that let that us do that either. We've done that in the last 
the last couple of years, we've done but, almost but exactly that. But each time that. it's been an individual decision that the board makes each year, so I don't know if we're required to do that or not. We are required to, to yeah. make, you all are required to make that decision every year by February 1st. Marianne. Uh, this brings up something I'm talk I've been thinking about, but um, I think we all will need to think about it. There are some things where the decision needs to be made early, -er, maybe even a year earlier, so that students can plan what their financial or housing lives will be. <clears throat> and um, Dr. Beebe has obviously been moving in that direction uh, on many decisions. I think particularly with financial decisions that uh, as we get um, more um, informed about the patterns, the financial patterns and the student needs, we need to start thinking longer term uh, than now. And that's a little hard for us who've been gone a long time from college to understand because this looks like a very small increase. But when I think uh, to my own college experience where all of the, everything that I was doing in college, I was earning the money for, uh, $27 might have knocked me out for a semester. And we don't want to do that, but if the $27. So let's, um, this is just the start of a planning process that we have to have anyway. I just would love to have it longer term. So noted. Good. Got okay. That. Good idea. Um, Good Peter. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to support both of the, both the points Jonathan made earlier. The first has to do with uh, the, the non um, or, or grandfathering this increase in for people uh, who have made their plans. It, there's an element of unfairness to suddenly realizing that your costs are going to increase after you've made the commitment to be here and you're here for the first year, you have two years to go. And, um, that would seem fairer and, and, and also by increasing the, the, the price of, uh, of a unit of, uh, of instruction here, we, we do, I think, risk changing the character of the person who is going to be applying. And, and I would not like to see that. I also like the idea that Marianne put forward and I wonder whether it might not be an idea simply to postpone this increase for a year and stipulate now that a year from now it will be $285. I don't think we can afford it, is where that, I am. That, that, that's I mean, a, we're, that's we're, a we're valid in. point, Marsha, but it hasn't been made. Yeah. That is, I don't have the numbers in front of me saying that this is why we can't afford it. When we were adopting our budget last year, we had the numbers in front of us about how much the increases were each year, and they were very significant in terms of our revenue for, mm -hmm. for our budget. Um, I mean, I, what worries me is the uncertainty in th at the national level and how that will affect our numbers, not this. <laughs> this does not worry me. What worries me is how are people going to feel about the United States? How are people going to feel about leaving their home within the United States? Mm -hmm. Things are changing there. Right. And that, I think, is more likely to have a, a significant impact on our projections, something that we won't know till next year. Um, at which point we all come together to try to figure this out again. So. Mm -hmm. Well, what would be the consequence of postponing this, this decision for a year? Or making the decision now? Probably a million or a more. Hmm? Probably a million or more dollars uh, to our Is budget. That a, and a significant amount? Very Is significant that? amount. And, and uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> The ways that we have to bridge a $9 million gap are not pleasant. <laughs> so, 
So, and and rest assured, we'll get a chance to air about that, talk about that too at the retreat. Okay. So, I, I I regret that we are required to make the decision now, but we are. So we have to live with that. You know, to Dr. Just Kugler's uh, point. Um, we can start this process sooner, and I vow to you that that's what we're going to do next year to be able to have some time to actually go through and figure this all out. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen this year. I thought that was where you were headed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Has everyone had their chance? Um. I've forgotten if it's a resolution, Angie. It, it is. is. Uh, All right, then it's Angie's turn. Trustee Nielsen. Aye. Trustee Hasland. Reluctantly, yes. Trustee Abood. Reluctantly, yes, as, as well. Trustee Croninger. Aye. Trustee Bloom. The most reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd add that. Aye. Trustee Gallardo. Aye. Trustee Kugler. Aye. Student Trustee Gribble. No. Marsha. I just wanted to um, say that I'm, uh, to explain a little bit, just that I'm really afraid that it, this will be looked at as balancing our budget on the backs of the international students, and, and I just don't see that we could do that even if we wanted to. No. But I know that um, <coughs> I don't like that message, and so I just wanted to make sure that that message is not what going to be happening and so that's my reluctance it's all there's a lot of factors going on here and that's why I think it's a good retreat topic because I, yeah. I would remind us all that we heard from um, Frank Rodriguez about the impacts of students from our college looking for housing right. that's a factor right. and how our community perceives us is a factor so there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, and there's not going to be any one right answer. And I'm not saying we're balancing the budget on the backs of, but we have gotten ourselves into a situation where a very substantial portion of our income is from this tuition. And we have to talk about that, too. I'm going to give you a profit and loss statement <coughs> on, on this uh particular topic, that's one of the things that I want to share with you at the retreat, and you'll see the magnitude of what we're talking about here, you know, bringing in ten and a half million dollars in gross revenues for this, for the, for the uh, non-resident students, and then I'll, you know, the million and a half costs, and I'll, I'll give you the whole breakdown of it. I mean, it's significant. It is significant. We're not balancing the budget on, on the non-resident students, to, to clarify that, because as you say, uh, Trustee Bloom, we wouldn't be able to do it anyway. It's, our, our deficit is too large. Um, but, you know, we, we can't continue to go on and say business as usual on all these topics, whether, you know, all the things that we're talking about at the college, whether we're talking about fees. We have to start making some tough decisions, and, I'm, and this is for the betterment of the whole. It really is. It's a tough decision. I don't like coming to, the, coming to you all with this kind of a thing. And, and I would just also remind us that the mechanism, f as you described, for calculating these fees is based on cost. Mm -hmm. And the only one that wasn't totally based on cost is the one we are using now and have not used in the past. And, and that piece of it that is above cost is not a lot of money. It's the $27. So, you know. You looked at the, uh, good look. in our, in our oh, packets we had um, similar mm -hmm. colleges throughout the state mm -hmm. that were had significantly higher rates yeah. and um, you know if we compare ourselves to those closest to us um, you know in as like institutions instead of just junior colleges or not by ge geography but by what they do uh, we're you know down there our rates quite low and I was not convinced uh, before that I really that I really had a firm grasp on what our actual costs are to provide that service because we never really got a good handle on those numbers. And the only handle I could come up with, and my arithmetic's fine, but where I got the numbers was probably not fine, was that you know we were not covering our costs before, mm -hmm. and I don't think that 
we should do that. And I don't think the state wants us to do that. So we need to cover those costs. And we need to, in this, these kind of times, we need to be really sure we're covering those costs. And we yeah. owe that to our districts that elected us. So that's Marianne, what I had to add. Am I correct uh, that um, there were several years when we did not change this number? That it was, it's not Last been year. increased mm -hmm. regularly? No, no. Or this one has, but not the whole package? Uh, we had years, for example, this last the last few years where we didn't change it. Yeah. Um, but that's that really isn't all that that common. For the most part, we've been we've been modifying the cost uh, the fee cost, and it's mm -hmm. it's been bumping up. Um, you know, as as Emily points out, I mean, we had a, a stretch there where it was 2010 to uh, 2016, um, where you know the costs weren't bumping up as, as rapidly maybe as it could have. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, having to keep, we're having to recover our costs. And when you have, you know, different expenses that are going up with, you know, it's not always covered by COLA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Emily? So to touch on the topic <coughs> of riding on the backs of out-of-state, out-of-area uh, students, um, I just kind of did some quick math. So if you did a 2016, 2017, you did four, you, four classes, you're considered full-time enrolled student. That's $3,132 for that student to come up with, right? And some of these situations, although many of our out-of-state, out-of-area students may be considered wealthier, a lot of it is situational. For myself, I had to get away from home. So it wasn't so much I want to go away to college because it's fun and it's an experience. I chose going to a community college away from my home because it was affordable. So if you look at 2016, 2017 for a full-time enrolled student, 3,132. This next upcoming year, it'll be 4,560. So that's an increase of over $1,000. So we're not talking $20, we're not talking $10, we're talking thousands. And so we might want to say wholeheartedly and with good intentions that we're not riding on the back of our out-of-state, out-of-area students, but I do not think that will be how the students perceive this increase. And as, 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 as much as we want to make it sound glamorous, that I don't think is gonna be the case. Well, I, I hope, I don't wanna end on that note, and I hope that they trust that our president, that our vice president, that Dr. Durrell, who live and breathe student success, even Lindsay, I mean, she crunches numbers to make sure that that mission gets fulfilled. This, and I will pick this up, but I mean, you, Jonathan, you guys have been so eloquent in talking about the rising tuition cost, period. The CSU, I mean, I got my credential, and then two years later when I got the master's, I was writing checks that were like substantially higher to the same institution just two years later. So this idea of tu tu tuition is, is just a problem in California. But I do trust the recommendation. I do trust that these numbers were crunched, that they looked at all our student populations to make sure that, no, they're not trying to put anything on the backs of anyone, that they're trying to eliminate financial hardships. Um, so I. I hear you from a student standpoint, but I hope that they trust our administration that when they crunch these numbers, they're doing it to ensure that we're fulfilling our mission and not cut it, closing the doors on students. Well, the fact is that there are very few ways by which we can generate mm -hmm. income. That's, that's a hard reality. That is hard. And, uh, and what you said is, is quite true, and that's why I reluctantly went forward with, uh, you know, with a yes vote but I don't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, um, that's a very practical comment, Peter. FTES, FTES, I hope there's and lots of food <laughs> at the retreat because I'm going to need it. <laughs> we we <laughs> have that in this. mind, yes. <laughs> brownies, <laughs> brownies, brownies, yeah, brownies are please. Are about to adjourn? I believe we're about to adjourn. Are we, uh, is anyone else? Um, oh, Peter wants to. Uh, I, I would. Usually, when when we adjourn, and if a faculty member has has passed away, we mm. we we er, we terminate the the meeting in honor of that faculty member or somebody who's been special to the campus. I'd I'd like to remember a student of mine. His name is Phil Womble. Oh, yeah. He uh, died at age 80. He was a student of mine in the 1970s. Uh, he suffered from spina bifida. A, a very crippling disease. He was completely bound to a wheelchair, and uh, 
his wheelchair would uh, run down the hall and obviously he was always in a hurry and he'd make a left turn into my office and there was a skid mark on the door <laughs> that indicated that Phil had just been here. Um, and he, he went on from here to uh, attend UCSB and has been uh, regaled as Mr. Gaucho and was in attendance at all of the major events, sporting events at, at UCSB. And, and uh, I, I don't remember him so much for his, his athletic prowess or his support of athletics, but I remember him as supportive of people like him who, uh, and, and, and people like me, who didn't understand people like him. And he took the time to help me understand. And, uh, and so I, uh, I remember Phil warmly. So we are adjourning in honor of Phil. Womble. Womble. Okay, we're adjourned. Here, here. Boy, this is an emotional meeting. Oh, I loved it. It was so great.